to have a quorum. Athena, yes. Yes. Good evening. It's September 19th, 2022. On July 16th of this same year, an act was signed into law which extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as of last week, people are actually allowed to attend in the room up to a limited capacity. It's also available on Amherst Media. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the September 19, 2022, primer on the master plan meeting of the town council to order at 531. This is the first of three meetings with all being accessible on the same Zoom link. I will call on each counselor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you. I'm going to begin with Shalini Balmel. I'm here. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke is not present at time yet. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney is not present at this point. Ah, there she is. Pam Rooney, can you indicate that you are present? Pam, can you indicate you're present? We can't hear you, Pam. I'm going to skip Pam for a moment while she works with that. Kathy Shane is not showing on the screen yet. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker is not showing on the screen. And Pam, have you been able to figure out your voice? Can you hear us? Please nod. But we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. If you're wearing earphones, you probably need to do something on the audio part down below that allows you to use headset. Athena, or someone else have better instructions, please offer them. No, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Jennifer? I think Alicia's in the audience. Thank you. Please sure. bring Alicia in. Hi, Alicia. Can you hear us? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi, and we can hear you. Thank you. Pam Rooney is present. She can't hear. I mean, she can hear us, but we can't hear her, and she's working on that. We are going to continue. Um, there is no chat, and if there's technical issues, given that we're expecting a thunderstorm, um, we want to make sure that you let us know if you lose connectivity. Please use the raise hand function if you have any questions. As I mentioned earlier, this is the first of three meetings tonight 
all using the same Zoom link. My phone. We're going to wait for announcements until we get to the regular meeting, which is we'll start at approximately 6.30 or later. Um, so let me begin by introducing the public, the primer. Each year is required by Charter Section 2.13. We have to hold a public forum on the master plan. Starting in 2019, we have provided a separate session prior to the public forum called Primer on the Master Plan. Fortunately, this has been continually provided by Planning Director Chris Brestrup, and it allows us to either learn or refresh our knowledge of the Master Plan and updates regarding actions related to the Master Plan. The plan was delivered. Okay, I need somebody to, okay. Um, the plan uh, was developed through a comprehensive process involving over a thousand Amherst residents. It was formally adopted by the planning board in 2010 and by the town council on November 9th, 2020. At the conclusion of the presentation on the primer, we will adjourn this meeting and move immediately to the public forum at 6.30 or at six o'clock or later. That will be the meeting in which we encourage the public to make comments and engage in dialogue. So Chris, thanks again for being with us this evening for the presentation and the updates and for all the work you do for the town. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director for the town of Amherst. And I'm here to give you a short presentation tonight about the master plan and then during the public forum to hear comments and concerns from the public about the master plan. First, I'd like to say a few general words about the master plan. The master plan is a dynamic long term planning document that provides I don't I don't really well I it's fine to leave this. Um, what do you call it starting slide cover slide up while I'm talking now. Um, so anyway, a master plan is a dynamic long-term planning document that provides a conceptual layout guide uh, for future to, to guide future growth and development. It's not the same as zoning. It doesn't tell us how wide the sidewalks should be or um, how high the buildings should be. It doesn't tell us what style of architecture should prevail in the town or what the streetscape should look like. And it doesn't tell us how many parking spaces there should be for each type of project. It's much more general than that. So getting down to specifics, we have a series of other plans that map out details for us, including our zoning bylaw. Um, since the master plan was completed in 2010, we've made many other plans at least one of which has been incorporated into the master plan by reference. And these other plans include the sewer extension plan, the housing production plan, the housing market study, the transportation plan, open space and recreation plan, bicycle and pedestrian network plan, community field master plan, and the climate action and adaptation and resiliency plan. And there may be other plans too that I have not listed here. We've also made many changes to our zoning bylaws since the adoption of the master plan, and we're currently working with the CRC and the planning board on a number of other zoning changes, including um, a zoning amendment on flood mapping, another one on making Article 14, which was temporary zoning allowing restaurants to operate during COVID, um, making that a permanent feature of the zoning bylaw. And we're also um, working uh, not quite in public yet, but sort of behind the scenes on a certain um, development um, zoning amendment that would allow uh, more types of housing development. Um, so the master plan that we'll talk to you about tonight was created over a period of 12 years from 1998 to 2010. And since um, we had not previously had a master plan, it took a long time to develop the one we have. Uh, the town should start the process for an updated master plan around 2025, with the goal of having an updated master plan by 2030. And this time, I hope it won't take 12 years to adopt a master plan, since much of the groundwork has already been laid. Meanwhile, we should work on implementing the master plan that we have, including continuing to create new plans to address issues that are important to the town, including changes to our zoning bylaw. 
So now let's talk about the master plan. And I'm going to ask Athena to scroll through this with me. So this is the um, 2022 version of the master plan primer. Next slide, please. Um, the, the one previous to this. That's the one. Yeah. So what is a master plan? Um, it's a community's general long-term blueprint for the future. It's a dynamic document, the beginning and not the end of a process. Next slide, please. Um, so what does the law say about a master plan? Master plan is required by Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 81D. Um, our master plan was adopted by the planning board in February of 2010 and adopted by the town council in accordance with the charter on November, uh, in November of 2020. The Amherst Home Rule Charter requires the adoption of a new master plan every 20 years. So um, by my reckoning, I think we should look towards a target date of 2030 for a new master plan, which means that we should begin planning for a new master plan around 2025. Next slide, please. Uh, so what does the law say about a master plan? Oh, I've already talked about that. Next slide, please. Um, this master plan was the first in Amherst for nearly 40 years and was based on an extensive public input. Um, in addition to public input, the master plan was also based on research on the community's existing conditions and anticipated trends for the future. And you can see some of that documentation if you go to the master plan webpage of the town's webpage. There are appendices which talk a lot about the existing conditions. Of course, those conditions existed in 2010 and not 2022, but it will give you a sense of the types of information that the master plan was based on. This master plan represents Amherst's best effort to balance competing interests of a diverse population. And of course, not everybody got everything they wanted, but we hope that most people got most of what they wanted. Next slide, please. Um, so the master plan really began, if you want to look back into ancient history, in about 1971, when the university was um, expanding quite a bit and there was a lot of development in town. And the town uh, established a, a group called SCOG, which is kind of a terrible name, but it was a very good group, the Select Committee on Goals, which worked from 1971 to 1973 and developed a report that is on our website. And the plan, the conceptual plan from that report is seen on the right hand side of your slide here um, with the rectangle in the middle representing downtown and the circles around the outside representing village centers and villages. Um, North Amherst Village Center, Cushman, um, two village centers, one commercial and one institutional in South Amherst. Um, on the right hand side, you can see Gatehouse Road, which hasn't quite developed into a village center. And then at the very south part of the uh, slide is, or a south part of the map is the um, South Amherst Village Center at Atkins Corner, where um, Atkins Farm Market is. Um, after the uh, Select Committee on Goals, well, really 20, more than 20 years later, um, Amherst hired Walt Kudnahowski's um, consulting firm to do a visioning process for the town. And that lasted from 1997 to 1998. And um, the, the Comprehensive Planning Committee worked with Walt Kudnahowski's company to develop this visioning process. Um, then the Comprehensive Planning Committee met, and they met regularly over a period of six years to work on how to proceed with this project that we were starting, Planning Amherst Together, which is the title of the master plan process. Um, we had substance, substantive participation from Hampshire College, Amherst College, and UMass, and $20,000 was appropriated by town meeting in 2004 to hire a consultant to establish a scope of work and a cost estimate for the work of planning Amherst together. And many community members were involved, including people who are still involved in our town government, Bruce Coldham, John Kuhn, Cheryl Zoll, who was the director of the Survival Center, Alyssa Brewer, who was a longtime uh, town meeting member and select board member, Aaron Hayden, Eric Nakajima, Jim Wald, and many others. In 2005, the town meeting voted an additional $65,000 to develop a master plan. Next slides, please. 
Then in 2006, Planning Amherst Together really began in earnest and um, a consultant was chosen, ACP was their name, and they worked with the um, engagement and support of the Comprehensive Planning Committee. And the town voted an additional $135,000. So we had $200,000 to work on our master plan and data was gathered. And you can see over on the uh, right hand side of your slide here that, um, you know, we really did gather a lot of people together to work on this master plan. Um, <clears throat> in 2007, there were public idea gatherings, group workshops, and a community survey was sent out to about I think it was over 600 randomly selected households to answer questions about what people wanted to see uh, for the future of Amherst. And the first draft of the master plan was prepared. And then from 2008 to 2010, the master plan subcommittee of the planning board edited that draft. And finally in 2010, in January, they held a public forum on the draft master plan. And then in February, the planning board voted to adopt the master plan. And then 10 years later, um, after we uh, adopted the charter, the town council also voted to adopt the master plan. Um, next slide, please. So what's in the master plan? Um, the master plan contains chapters that are uh, required by mass general law, and they are as follows. Um, there's the first section on goals and policies. A ne next section on land use, which is the one that's most near and dear to the planning department's um, heart. That's the one we work on the most. The next one is uh, demographics and housing. And of course we work on housing too. Um, economic development, natural and cultural resources, open space and recreation, services and facilities, which would include things like schools and fire department and police department, et cetera, transportation and circulation, and then the last one is implementation. Next slide, please. So how is the master plan organized? Um, it begins with a statement of key directions, and some of them are um, maintain Amherst's existing community character. And I think that's a really important um, direction that we all share. Uh, provide housing that meets the needs of all residents while minimizing impacts on the environment. And that means all residents, um, all different uh, ethnic groups, all different uh, income levels, et cetera. And that's, that is a challenging uh, thing to do, um, <clears throat> especially not to have an impact on the environment. Um, diversify and expand the economic base. And that's another one that's challenging and it's hard to, um, to uh, entice um, companies to come, in, to come to Amherst sometimes, but we have, um, many people in town who are working on that and promote an ethic of sustainable environmental energy practices in all town activities and i think we try really hard uh, on that um, goal as well so next slide please um is it the one right before this did we already go through that anyway okay so land use um Land, I said land use was near and dear to my heart, and these are some of the objectives under the land use section of the master plan. Preferentially direct future development to existing built up areas. So what that means is that we try to preserve as much of the outlying areas of town as we can and to direct development to those places that were shown on that, um, that original gray and black plan that I showed you that showed the downtown and showed village centers. So those are the places that we try to direct development to. And since that map was developed, um, we also have the development along University Drive, which is another built up area that we try to direct development to. Um, preserve key undeveloped lands. So this is something that Amherst has done a lot of, and um, we have many properties in town that have conservation restrictions on them. Um, and those are both um, purchased conservation restrictions as well as um, donated conservation restrictions. And we, the town also owns a lot of land that is, is conserved. Um, and the next uh, goal is to protect key farmland and farming. And we've done a really good job of this. Um, we have a lot of agricultural preservation restrictions. And you can see along Northeast Street and Southeast Street, some of the fruits of the labors there where we have, you know, vast swaths of farmland that have been protected. 
Um, guide new housing growth while minimizing impact on open space and small town rural, rural character. And one of the ways we do that is that we have a cluster subdivision zoning bylaw, which promotes the idea of um, having subdivisions that use a minimal amount of land to provide housing and also um, preserve open space. So an example of this is the Vista Terrace development, which is in South Amherst across from Atkins Farms. And that was 11, I think it was 11 acres altogether, four of which were developed for housing and seven of which are, are being um, given to the town as open space. So we're very excited about that. Uh, the last one here is honor historic and cultural character and beauty of neighborhoods. And so we've established three um, local historic districts, and we work very hard to um, preserve historic buildings in town, as you will um, note that the Historical Commission and the Local Historic District Commission both work very, very hard on that. Next slide, please. Demographics and housing. So we try to encourage a greater mix of housing types, sizes, and prices serving a wider range of income levels. And this is really challenging because the price of land is so expensive in Amherst that um, developers are encouraged by the price of the land to develop large, expensive houses. Um, so we see a lot of that happening in our subdivisions. Um, at the same time, we get... Um, we are able to get subsidies from various sources, state sources, as well as community preservation grants and, um, and other grants to develop low income housing, but there's nothing really that's helping us to develop moderate income housing. And that's something that we have to work on. Um, the next one is preserve and expanding, expand the number of affordable and moderately priced rental units and housing stock. So again, I think, you know, we have a pretty good handle on affordable, below a certain level, but it's the moderately priced that really gives us a challenge. Um, encourage the production of housing in an environmentally sound manner. And I think uh, we try very hard to do that. We've um, established the stretch building code as one of our uh, guides to developing housing. And some of the new buildings in town are actually quite environmentally sound. Um, even though they, they take their large buildings, but they're built in a way that really preserves the environment. Um, and then improve housing and services for people who are homeless. And the town has worked very hard on this. They worked with Craig's Doors to house homeless people, particularly in the cold months, but we're also working on a way to um, permanently house people who are homeless. Um, and we have a project, actually a project on North Pleasant, Northampton Road, rather, on 132 Northampton Road that is being developed. Um, and some of the people who are going to live in that housing are people who are homeless or have been homeless. Next slide, please. Then um, another goal is to, um, under natural and cultural resources, to promote the preservation, appreciation, and sustainable use of our historical and cultural resources. So, um, you know, as part of it is the landscape, part of it is the beautiful old buildings that we have, and we also have uh, cultural resources that we try to uh, protect, but also to promote. And one of the ways we promote them is through the um, Amherst Cultural District, which was formed about five or six years ago. Um, and we also tried to apply principles of environmental sustainability townwide. And the picture on the right is a picture of the Kern Center at Hampshire College, which is one of two living bu building challenge um, buildings in town that, that we're very proud of. Buildings that can kind of survive by themselves off the grid in terms of um, eventually water, sewer, electricity, and everything. I'm not exactly sure what the status of this one is, but um, it's primarily self-sustaining. Next slide, please. Um, the next objective is to do something about transportation and circulation and to actively promote alternative modes of transportation. And I'm sure you all have noticed that we have um, a good bike share system going on here now. We started off with a limited number of bike stations, but over time, um, the town has worked with um, other cities and, and towns in the area to develop a more robust a system of bike share. And um, we've been adding little by little to our uh, bike share stations. And they're quite 
um, have heavily used. Um, provide adequate public parking to support existing and desired new development in downtown and elsewhere. And this is something that we struggle with. We've had a um, number of conversations about where we can possibly put public parking, and that's an ongoing conversation. Um, and pursue funding strategies for achieving transportation goals. And this is something that's always on our minds, and we're constantly looking for um, money from the state and other sources to um, achieve our transportation goals. And recently, we've had some success with getting a, um, a MassWorks grant to build the roundabout at, um, at Pomeroy Village. Um, <clears throat> but we also worked with the state to uh, redesign the section of Route 9 from the center of town down to University Drive. And although we didn't receive money for that, we did work with the state very closely on uh, the design of that section of Route 9. So we're looking forward to seeing that construction come to an end. Um, next slide, please. And implementation is the last chapter of the master plan. Initially, a master plan implementation committee was to be uh, formed and the select board did um, develop a, a charge for that committee, but um, the committee was never really uh, populated. Um, and even so, we are uh, still working on implementing the master plan. A lot of the different things that the town works on are part of the master plan implementation grid. Um, Doug Marshall, who is the chair of the planning board now, and I spent considerable time in the fall of 2020 looking at that implementation grid and um, kind of filling in information about what had and hadn't been done and who had done it and when it was done and who's responsible and all of that. So, so we do have a draft of that available if anyone wants to see that. Um, but as I said, we continue to implement the master plan, even though it's not in a, um, what should I say, organized, uh, concerted effort as, as was initially um, proposed. And we do involve a wide variety of stakeholders in the implementation, even though the implementation tends to be um, kind of piecemeal instead of a, 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 you know, an ongoing organized uh, project. Um, and we do require concurrence with the master plan. So whenever we do a zoning amendment, we have to make a statement that the uh, zoning amendment is in concurrence with the master plan. Next slide, please. I have the next, oh yeah, thanks. So what have we accomplished since adopting the master plan and how have we implemented the master plan's objectives and strategies? Next slide, please. Um, one of the things we've done a pretty good job on, as I was saying earlier, is uh, affordable housing. We have a lot of affordable housing in town. Um, I think we have over 12%, something like 12.75% of our uh, housing units are, quote, affordable according to the state's definition. So on the left here, you see Olympia Oaks, which was developed a number of years ago, that provides 44 units of affordable housing to people making 80% or less of area median income. And it's really a beautiful community. I drove through it about a month ago, and it's um, very well laid out, and this, the buildings are well maintained, and um, it looks like a great place to live. Um, and then there's Main Street housing on the, on the right here, and that was a, an endeavor by the Amherst Housing Authority. So even they're, they're, they're not part of the town government, they are kind of part of our community and they've developed 11 units of affordable housing here and they're really beautiful, um, well-maintained units. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so how do we get affordable housing? Um, there are a number of different strategies that we use. Uh, one of them is to preserve existing units, and we've done that at Rolling Green, where there are about 200 units altogether, and the town worked with um, Beacon Communities to encourage Beacon to uh, purchase the Rolling Green property when it was about to go off the rolls, if you will, of affordable housing and, and become all market rate housing, and the town contributed, I believe it was $1.2 million to um, that effort and Beacon uh, did purchase that property and has managed to maintain 40 units of affordable housing at Rolling Green. Um, other projects are developer driven. Some of them are um, 
examples would be North Square at the Mill District, which was also developed by Beacon Communities, and that's the um, area up by Coles Lumber. Um, you may be familiar with the provision store up there and other uh, commercial things that are starting up, but that has 130 units of housing altogether, and 26 of them are affordable. Habitat for Humanity takes um, uh, advantage of small sites, and the picture over here on the right is a picture of a development that they built in on East Pleasant Street, where there are two units of affordable housing, both occupied by families. And then um, Valley CDC, Valley C Community Development Corporation, as I mentioned earlier, is developing a building at 132 Northampton Road that will house people, some of whom make 80% or less of area median income but there are also units set aside for those making 50% or less or 30% or less, and a few units set aside for people who have come out of the mental health um, community who are trying to make, uh, make a way for themselves on their own. Um, we also have inclusionary zoning, which we've improved a couple of times in the last few years, and reap the benefits of that. Um, presidential apartments is one where we, they added 54 units and we got, I think we got six affordable units out of that. 70 University Drive where we got a four um, affordable units out of a 36 unit building. Aspen Heights, which is a, a big new building on Route 9 and um, 88 units altogether. There are 11 of them that are affordable. And University Drive South, this is something that's just being uh, completed right now as we speak. And that is a, a nice looking new building at the entrance to Amherst with um, 45 apartments altogether, five of which are affordable. And a new one that was just um, just permitted at 40, 446 Main Street near the railroad tracks. And that's going to have 23 units of housing, three of which are affordable. So incrementally, we're adding affordable units all over town, which is really the right way to do it, not to have them all clustered in one location. Uh, so the town's role in um, developing affordable housing is multifaceted. There's, uh, we work on the zoning bylaw to try to make it um, as you know, encouraging of affordable housing as we can. The town acts as a facilitator where we get a developer and the state and consultants together to um, work on projects. So the town had a role in um, getting the uh, actors at the North Square at the Mill District together to develop that project. Um, we also provide funding and the funding can be uh, in various sources. Community Preservation Act funds um, are often used by these developers to um, develop their affordable housing. We provide a tax incentive, um, which actually to date has only been used by the Beacon communities, but that was a, a good tax incentive for them to help them with North Square. And then uh, there are other types of grants that we can make available to, um, to developers to provide affordable housing. We help developers through the permitting process, um, the 40B, you might have heard of that which is a daunting process, but um, we're committed to developing affordable housing. So developers who are using that mechanism for uh, getting permits for their projects, we try to help them with that. And the town also um, purchases land or owns land and then donates it or sells it for a very nominal price to uh, developers of affordable housing. And we're currently uh, working with a developer on Belchertown Road and the East Street School, where the town owned the land and is going to be um, turning it over to the developer to build, to build affordable housing there. Next slide, please. So here are some pictures of the projects that I've been talking about. North Square at the Mill District is in the upper left, and that's where Provisions is. And um, Cinda Jones is developing some stores on the ground floor, but there are 130 units here, 26 of which are affordable, and they're really beautiful units. Aspen Heights is down below on the left-hand side, and that's uh, the building along Route 9. And then One University Drive South is the building that's just under construction that's going to have five affordable units. It's a mixed-use building, and it will also have the eye physicians of Northampton um, prominently located in the front part of the building. Next slide, please. 
Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, I couldn't not mention them. They're part of local government. They get their powers from the state law and local regulations. Um, they have a high priority on creating affordable housing and they um, bring people together and talk and advocate for affordable housing. They also um, can provide funding for affordable housing developments and act as a facilitator for those types of projects. And John Hornick has been very instrumental in their um, very energetic promotion of affordable housing. Next slide, please. Uh, that's going backwards, yeah. Oh, okay, so what are we continuing to work on? That's part of the master plan. Um, again, adequately addressing homelessness and the need for more affordable housing. I talked about Belchertown Road and the East Street School. Repairing aging infrastructure, roads, bridges, and sidewalks. And often we have to reach out to the state to get um, grants to do that. Um, constructing new sidewalks on Mill Lane. We used some of our community development block grant funds to connect the sidewalks and the develop the housing on East Hadley Road with Groff Park. So this is a really great new um, way of getting people to Groff Park. Um, now, this is a challenging one, refining a plan to address our four large capital projects in a time of rising costs. That would be the library, the school, a fire station, and the Department of Public Works building. Updating the zoning and general bylaws. We've had some recent successes here. We updated the zoning bylaw to make it easier to build uh, accessory dwelling units without having to go through a laborious permitting process. And we moved our um, preservation of historic buildings from the zoning bylaw to the general bylaw, um, making it more clear about how we're going to be uh, pres preserving historic buildings. And we also apply the principles of environmental sustainability townwide. As I mentioned before, we have the stretch building code, which is part of the building code. We have net zero for municipal buildings, and we're going to be dealing with that as we um, move ahead with some of our projects. And we also have recently created the solar bylaw working group. The town manager established that working group to work on a, a solar zoning bylaw as well as <clears throat> a site assessment for where would it be most appropriate to put um, solar installations. Next slide, please. So this uh, comes to the end of my presentation. And um, if there's time and Lynn is agreeable, well, there isn't time because it's five after six. So <laughs> thank you very much for listening. And I hope that um, people have some good questions and comments during the public forum. Chris, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now adjourn this meeting and immediately move to calling the next meeting to order. The next meeting is actually the public forum required by the charter to address the master plan. And again, we've already talked about the open meeting law and I'm, but I am going to now begin to call the quorum of the council. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the September 19, 2022 special town council meeting public forum to address the master plan. Uh, to order at 6.08. This is the second of three meetings, all of which are on the same Zoom link. I have checked with many counselors, but others have joined us, and I need to check with um, Mandy Jo Haneke. You've Present. Yep. Yeah. And Pam Rooney, can you hear us, and would you see if we can hear you? I'll come back to Pam. Uh, Kathy Shane, can you hear yes, us? Yes, I can hear. Yep, I'm here. Can hear you. Great, thanks. So I'm waiting for Pam Rooney to indicate that she can hear us and we can hear her. Uh, Are there this is, any this is, counselors? This is Pam. This is, Pam. This is yes. Pam. Great. I can hear. I can hear you beautifully. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. So we've worked out all of the technological problems. Uh, please let me know if there are any other counselors who cannot hear us. All right. Um, so um, I've already mentioned that this is a formal process. Pam, you have your hand up. Can I double check one more time that this works? It does. We hear Good. you and you can hear us. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much, Pam. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a requirement of the charter and we started back in 2019 to hold the primer, which we've just had. Um, but this is really the time for residents to comment. And uh, so I'm going to just um, ask for anybody who is on Zoom and there is nobody in the room, uh, if you would please raise your hand if you would like to make a public comment. I just want to note that there are 19 people in the audience. At this point, I'm only seeing four hands. I have the feeling I'll see more. Um, and the public comment at this time is only on the issue of the master plan. When we go to the regular council meeting, there will be another general public comment period. If you have public comments that do not rate, relate to the master plan, that is the time to make those comments. Okay. Um, if you're joining by Zoom, you're going to raise your hand. If you're zoning by the, if you're joining by phone, you use star nine. And let me also mention at the conclusion of the public forum and no earlier than 630, we will go back. We will move on to the regular town council meeting. So I'm going to begin by calling on Steve Dunn. Please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Athena is bringing people into the room. Thank you. Am, am I in the room? You are in the room. <laughs> Great, I, I don't see myself, so. Right. Um, well, thank you. I am part of the North Amherst Master Plan Study Group. Um, there's 15 of us that, uh, and with a handful of others who couldn't participate every week, but we met for five weeks and we each got our own copy of the master plan and we covered chapters every week. Uh, and because we are a North Amherst group, much of our focus was on North Amherst, but uh, truly everything that we covered could be expanded out to the town pretty um, uh, correctly. Um, we were a pretty diverse group and our discussions were wide ranging. We can't pretend to speak for everyone in North Amherst, but uh, we were a fairly diverse uh, set of viewpoints. And I, uh, I would say that the report that you received from us, I believe you all received a packet of our report. Um, it covers all of the uh, discussions pretty well. Now it's, it's eight pages long and uh, I understand being a counselor has to be time consuming, but I do hope that you would all take the time to read this report. Uh, it covers quite a lot. And North Amherst is a pretty good macrocosm for Amherst as a whole. So as I already said, some of our concerns are pretty well focused on North Amherst, but many apply broadly across the whole town. Uh, on the second page of our report, um, in the second half of that page, we have a set of bullet points. And, and I just want to touch on some of those very briefly because uh, they are kind of highlighted points. First of all, when we had our discussions we found that our thinking was really hindered by a lack of information, uh, up-to-date information in the master plan. So we would really love to see an inventory taken that would help us in thinking about land use and economic development uh, as it pertains to zoning issues in particular. Um, we would uh, really like to see a village design guideline uh, something that would apply probably to all the village centers, but uh, particularly form-based zoning and uh, something I just learned about, which is transfer development rights. These are things that would help us a great deal in thinking about how to implement the master plan in our own neighborhoods. Uh, there's a lot of other things in here, um, things like taxable student housing and more venues 
for neighborhoods, uh, how to deal with e-commerce, which is taking over our businesses. And there's, there's a lot in here. So thank you for your time. I do hope uh, that you'll find the time to read through our report. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. And uh, we did receive that report during the day and it has been added to the packet. However, it was not listed as an agenda item uh, at this time. Okay. Uh, the I know there was a second person who was going to speak to that report. Michelle, can you tell me who that is? I think um, both Cinda and Eve and Janet all, all probably would like to speak to it. I'm that's all, right. all I would it, that I can see on the attendees. Thank you. Uh, the next person in line, however, is Kathy Axelson Berry. Please enter the room, state your name, and where you live. Hi, uh, Kitty Axelson Berry. I live in Echo Hill South, which is District Two. So. Um, I've noticed, I've observed that what, for one thing, there's no implementation committee as, as Christine Restrup mentioned. Um, but in addition to that, there has been, it seems a lot of cherry picking of the master plan, um, kind of ignoring the points about preserving the, and honoring small town character and honoring the character of neighborhoods. So I have two questions. Wouldn't it be helpful to have an actual implementation committee um, rather than um, have things done piecemeal? And I know that the planning department has plenty to do without figuring all of this out itself. Um, and this relates to what um, Jennifer Taub calls the, the need for a year round population for a year round economy. And I'm wondering if that appears anywhere in the um, in the master plan, because we have we seem to be having a real imbalance at this point with an overload of um, undergraduate students and maybe even a loss of population of year round residents. That is my comment. Kitty, thank you for joining us. Um, the next person with their hand up is Cinda Jones. Please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Hi there, uh, my name is Cinda Jones and I live at 232 Amity Street and Meg Gage invited me to be part of the North Amherst group because I'm a stakeholder there as a vision area of the Mill District. She asked me to speak tonight about our master plan input, but I'm going to spin that a bit. Instead of repeating what we wrote in the report, I wanted to thank the District 1 Neighborhood Association because of their inclusivity and leadership. And I'd like to suggest that every district consider undertaking the charrette that Meg and Michelle led in District 1. We did a SWOT analysis and we considered what a very diversely interested group of people thought were North Amherst strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And then we were able to review the master plan chapter by chapter with objectivity and commonality and we determined what we thought communally was best for our part of town. Um, Pam Rooney used to live on Sunderland Road, so she joined us for a couple of the meetings, and she added great perspective because she misses all that North Amherst has to offer. And I hope that she and Jennifer Taub and Dorothy Pam will gather the same sort of diverse group of stakeholders in my district, where I live, and plan a united path forward because there's an opportunity to, instead of be opposed to different people's progress, to determine what we share in interests and work together toward common goals. If what that SWOT analysis I gave to Beacon and when they do their next phase, they're going to know the easy way to get something approved with community support. And if every district could tell people what they want to see in their neighborhoods, like Dona is enabling in North Amherst, then this town would have clearer progress and neighbors would be happier with the results. Um, but just imagine the number of residents who would feel heard. And I thank you for listening to me. Good night. Cinda, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, Eve Vogel, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. 
Hi, can you all hear me? We can. Excellent. So I'm Eve Vogel. I live on Harlow Drive, which is in precinct, the former precinct three, district one, um, sort of halfway between East Pleasant and North Pleasant and Eastman and Pine, sort of in the middle of that quadrangle. Um, I participated in the North Amherst group, and I'm going to build on what Cinda just said, which is that I actually think that the way this group worked and the kind of dialogue that Meg and Michelle and Kathy before um, and other folks have really um, created a kind of openness uh, of dialogue and real um, problem solving, you know, just practical problem solving that I think is actually a pretty good model for the town. And um, and it would be good to look at the report and also just talk about how, how they did it. Um, I'm gonna just briefly talk about why I think North Amherst is a microcosm for the town and the kind of issues that we got to, didn't resolve all of them, but I think you'll see in our report that we at least got to some ideas about sort of where to, to look um, is, is relevant to the rest of the town. So North Amherst has two village centers. So one of them is quite developed. Um, in North Amherst, there's also Cushman. Um, North Amherst, as you know, has uh, significant commercial and also really dense residential um, populations right there. Um, there are historic landscapes throughout North Amherst that include neighborhoods, conservation lands, farms, and also an old industrial district. And so recognizing that industry is really a part of Amherst history and our place seemed really relevant to thinking about how to um, build a kind of integrated vision for the town. Oh my gosh, I talked to you slow. Um, nonetheless, there's overall separation of those low income communities that are really concentrated in dense neighborhoods and separated from the neighborhoods. And often when we talk about the cultural landscape of the town and what the town's character is, we're not including those communities. And the people from those communities were also not part of our group. So I think we collectively need to make a big effort to make sure they are included both in terms of representation, but also in consideration as a part of what this town is about. Um, yeah, I'll second what Kitty said. There's a concern about increasing unaffordability, developer interest in student housing instead of family housing. Um, we do have a multi-use development in North Amherst that um, does offer a potential good model. It's facing some challenges. It needs to have better transportation connections that don't rely on cars. Um, so there's lots that can be done, but it has a potential to build on. I'm running out of time and I'm guessing I'm not gonna get an extra minute. So I'll just say um, the report is worth looking at. North Amherst is uh, appreciative of the District One Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Eve, thanks for joining us and for your comments. Uh, Janet Keller, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You need to unmute. I'm there. Yeah, you got All it. All right. All right. I too want to um, urge other groups to meet uh, together. And I di um, we weren't as diverse as we wanted to be, but it was um, nonetheless a di it did bring some diversity of um, approach and experience. And um, it was, first of all, a lot of fun um, and uh, to get to know one another and um, to hear the insights from different uh, life experiences and the different suggestions. And um, I, so I want to, uh, uh, give uh, recognition to pulling the group together to Michelle and to Meg for doing that and for the folks who, who came to uh, our group. Um, and I especially want to hone in on the need for more net zero. I heard Chris say um, that commercial um, uh, private development is uh, not held to net zero um, now the way uh, the town is. 
And I hope we are going to move with enthusiasm toward that because it is now extremely affordable. Um, I've been dragging my own heels and um, on getting solar up on my roof, although my house is well insulated. But if I do that, I'm going to be way ahead of the game financially. And that's um, with the recent rise in um, energy prices, which have been huge. Um, that's an opportunity that I really hope um, that the leaders of the town um, take on enthusiastically because it, it can um, change um, things for the environment and for the economy. Um, and I think that's all I want to say right now. Um, but I do hope we, we um, look into it and see how, um, how uh, economically beneficial it is and adopt net zero with enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Laura Drucker, you have your hand up. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Laura Drucker. I'm in um, District 1 now, I think, although I've been in District 2 until recently. I actually wasn't going to talk during this section, but because I live in North Amherst and this is the first I'm hearing of this group, I just want to offer a different perspective, which is that I don't think you're reaching out to everyone. Um, I look forward to reading this master plan, but it's a little disconcerting that we're talking, spending the entire time, we're supposed to be talking about this town master plan, talking about one particular area in town. Um, when I look at the list of the people that worked on this report, these are wonderful people who are very um, involved in, in things in the town all the time. And it seems like I just, I know other folks have said this, but it seems like we haven't gotten the full breadth of input from everybody that lives in North Amherst. Laura, thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment at this time? Hilda Greenabaum, I see your hand. Please enter the room, state your name. And this is public comment in relationship to the master plan only. Yes, I understand that. Hilda okay. Green, 298 Montague Road. And there's one thing that I wanted to point out about North Amherst, which makes us rather unique among the other four districts. And that's that back in with the 2010 census, and uh, form-based codes was on the agenda. I did a cross correlation of who owned the homes with the census, with the property records. And I counted back then, and that's before the mill district housing and other housing up here. We were only like 12% owner occupied, which meant we had in many ways a more transient population than other parts of town, which meant there was less of a stakehold and at that point, not very many people were voting, maybe 100, now we're up to 330 in the last election a couple of weeks ago. But that, it, it's rather difficult in that we, we really need more middle income homeowners for stability in our neighborhood. And I'm pushing owner occupied because when people own their homes, they seem to have more of a stake in what's going on. And uh, that, that's basically what I want to say that, that, that I, we may be one of the lowest home, middle income homeowners districts of all of them. And, and that needs to be looked at carefully in future planning. Hilda, thank you for joining us tonight. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment? Meg Gage, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, everyone. I'm Meg Gage. I live at 208 Montague Road, very briefly. There's a draft transportation plan, and I encourage us to make it a permanent transportation plan. And I also want to note that there are implications of all of these recommendations on the planning staff. And we know they're really stretched. We appreciate all they do. 
and hope that we might be creative in finding other ways of, of achieving some of these goals that don't put more pressure on our staff. Thank you, everybody. Meg, thanks for joining us. Are there any other comments with regard to the master right? plan? That's and this great. is the sure. we're coming to the end of the master plan forum. Seeing no other comments, and it is 6.30, I'm going to adjourn the meeting that includes the master plan public forum and immediately move into the regular town council meeting. Since we've had a variety of people join us, we're going to begin this meeting as if we were starting a little over. Okay. So it's September 19th, 2022, based on a July 2022 act signed into law by the legislature, approved by the governor. It extended the provisions of open meeting law. That allows us to continue to meet in the manner that we are. However, I do want to mention that we have also now voted to include access to the town room for the public up to a limited number of people. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the September 19, 19th, 2022 town council meeting to order at 631. This is the third meeting of the evening and with all being accessible in the same Zoom link. I'm going to call on each counselor, make sure that they can hear us and we can hear them. Shalini Baumel. I'm here. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Uh, Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. As stated before, there's no chat room. And if you have technical issues, please let me know. Briefly, we're going to go to the announcements. And I want to just make note of one announcement, and that is this Friday, September 23rd at 10 o'clock in front of the town hall, we will do a Puerto Rican Heritage Day celebration. Otherwise, uh, the council will not meet again until October 3rd, and committee meetings are as shown. We're going to move on to our next agenda item. This is a hearing with regard to an Eversource petition to install one fully owned Eversource pole on Pomeroy Lane between two existing poles. Austin Harpin has, enjoy, has joined us this evening and in your packet is also a recommendation from the Department of Public Works. Public hearings are an opportunity for us to hear from the petitioner and also to um, hear from the public. So we're going to start with a brief uh, presentation by the petitioner and show you the map for the placement of the polls. Austin, are there things that you would like to say at this time? Hi, good evening. This is Austin and I'll be representing Eversource. So I am proposing to install a mid-span pole between pole 110 over 18 and 110 over 17 to provide 157 Pomeroy Lane with power. Can one of the questions that is regularly asked by the council is, is there any way to not put in an additional pole since you have two other poles in close proximity? And then I'm going to move to other councilor questions. So the, the reason we're installing or proposing to install a new pole is because pole 110 over 18 has a primary riser on it that feeds Pomeroy Court. So I need to install a transformer. And with those two, there's not enough room on the pole. And then 110 over 17 would be 
too far from where the house is going to be built. So voltage drop becomes an issue. For um, 157 Pomeroy Lane, the house is set back pretty far. It's going to be over 400 feet from the roadway. So I really want to uh, install the transformer as close as possible there. So that would be the reason for installing the new pole. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from counselors? Mandy Johanneke. Um, one comment and a couple of questions. Um, I think you just answered one of them, which is, I was unclear, is this house just doesn't have power now, it must be a new build and that's why we need to do this. Um, right. The poll petition itself indicated that we would be, if we did the order that we would be allowing Eversource to do underground utilities too, um, or running of cables underground. And so would that require cutting into the road? And if so, does the order need a requirement to return the road to similar condition? And then the order doesn't include the police and fire cross arm allowance that the request original, the first page of the request said that there would be an allowance for. So do we need to put that allowance in the order? Austin, would you like to address those questions? So the um, everything's gonna be overhead to feed this house. So it'll, it'll be overhead wires going across the road. So there'll, there'll be no need for a road cut. And then to address the second question, I'll, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Um, then in that case, we'll have to leave the hearing open. Correct? Mandy Jo? Or just not vote though. Or just not vote tonight. Until the order is fixed. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions from counselors? Okay. Are there any people who would like to make public comment or ask a question with regard to this specific poll? I am not seeing any. I'm going to come back and just ask if there's any other council questions. Shalini? Yeah, this is already stated in um, the DBW's letter about minimum impact to the trees in the area, but I just wanted to make sure that that is stated and uh, that we have uh, confirmation from Eversource and maybe an understanding of how you will move forward without impacting the trees there. Austin? So um, this, this poll set wouldn't require any tree removal or tree trimming. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from counselors? Then I'm going to close the hearing, but when we get to this item, we're actually not going to vote tonight. So we will be pulling it from the consent agenda until we get additional information. Mandy Jo? I'll just amend it once it's off consent. Okay. Would, would you mind repeating the question that I need to uh, get back to you on? Mandy Jo? Sure. On page three of our, our packet, um, page one is the letter that Eversource sent the town council. Page two, I think, is the backside of that letter. Page three says petition for pole and wire locations. There is a, the last paragraph says, your petitioners agree to reserve space for one cross arm at a suitable point on each of said poles for the fire and police telephone signal wires belonging to the municipality and used by it exclusively for municipal purposes. But two pages later, the order for poll locations does not include that paragraph. So when we get to that item, first of all, I was wondering why it doesn't include that paragraph. And when we get to the item, I believe we just have to add that paragraph into the order and then vote the order with the paragraph added. Okay, so add that paragraph to page three. Yes, from page three to page five. It's not included in the page five okay. to six order. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, we, um, with that, I'm going to close the hearing. Do we have to vote on that? Um, I know it's not on the motion sheet. We normally vote. It's not on the motion sheet. Do we have to vote to close a hearing? All right. I move to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. And with uh, since we have a mixture of remote and in person, 
I'm going to quickly take a vote. And that is, um, I'm going to begin with Pat DeAngelis. To, this Aye. is a vote to close the hearing. Aye. Anna, Anna Devon Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke is aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Thank you. Um, Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Leisha Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmil. Yes. It's unanimous. We've now closed the hearing and we are going to move on to our next item. The next item on our agenda tonight is pub general public comment. Um, residents are welcome to express their views for as many minutes as I tell you once I ask. Please raise your hand if you would like to make general public comment. Are there any other people who would like to make general public comment? So far, I'm seeing two hands. I'd like anybody else who would like to make general public comment to raise their hand. Okay, we're going to begin right now. There are three. Bob Pam, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. I believe this is the time for the only time for comments on the agenda for tonight. That's correct. Okay. Okay. My name is Bob Pam. I live on Amity Street. I am a Jones Library trustee, but I am speaking for myself. I believe the risks to the Jones Library based on current facts make stopping the project the prudent choice. I understand that others may come to a different conclusion. The library board and other project supporters argue that the financial risk will look very different in 16 months. Affordable bids will come in and new funding sources will materialize for this construction project. The proposal that will come before you says that if you decide when the bids are opened, that it is beyond our means and that the project shouldn't continue then either the town or the library will pay roughly $2.2 million of our own funds for the planning work done up to that point. Ending it now, we would pay about $400,000. So the immediate question is a $1.8 million bet. And on a year and a half without upgrading anything at the library on the hope that it will all work out. I also hope that proponents of advancing to that step will agree to having some or all of their contributions applied toward these costs if it comes to that. As an individual resident of Amherst, I have been a pretty close observer of the project's design evolution. The design incorporates spaces for all the requested functions, but other decisions are, in my opinion, problematic practically and aesthetically. Floor to ceiling windows with their required framing seems illog illogical and expensive because library patrons will want to sit in front of them and block their lower third. And the heat loss from these large north facing windows will be maximized. In addition, to reduce cost, the sawtooth structures on the roof will be eliminated while the enormous flat skylight will remain, bringing possible leakage issues into our future again. The value engineering exercise is leading toward acoustical ceiling tiles and exposed roof trusses and pipes, like a partially finished loft. To bring down costs further, the current plan does not finance some or all of the computers 
furniture, solar panels, and landscaping that I thought were included. Maybe the next round of fundraising would cover their costs, but I think it likely that some will appear in a future town budget. I supported the project last year and I contribute to it. And I wish I could continue to do so, but I don't. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, uh, Trustee Pam. Uh, Ken Rosenthal, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, my name is Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue. I, Bob, Pam and I did not plan to speak together. Um, you're gonna hear from me a, a, a response in effect to something that he has just said. He has told you based upon his understanding and he is the chief financial officer of the library based on the professional advice from the library's paid planners that the project cannot continue forward as planned. You are gonna be considering tonight whether to spend about a million point eight a million eight hundred thousand dollars to have the plans developed so that they can go to bid. I propose another alternative for you to take that money that you are going to spend on developing the current plans to go to bid and use the same planners, the people who know the library very well, to plan for you a renovated library on, on the same footprint that the library now exists. I submit to you that there may be as much as $30 million available for this kind of a project, because you're planning to already, you've already committed $15.8 million in town borrowing, plus a million dollars from the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee. The library itself has already raised a couple of million dollars with some commitments that they claim will be received they project that they can raise another 11 million, a, a total of $14 million with another $11 million that they can still raise. I don't believe they can, but if they raise a good part of that, that will help. I think also you can go back to the uh, Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners together with the legislators in Boston to ask them to change the way they handle their grants so that libraries other than Am including Amherst, but other than Amherst as well, can make changes in their plans and still qualify for some portion of, of grants. And if you do that, I think that you will find that you will be able to have a renovated library, environmentally sound, one that we can all use that meets the current conditions that have evolved over the time of pandemic. So I urge you to spend the money now not to continue to plan the library as originally planned, but as renovated on, on, this, on the current footprint. Um, and I hope you will listen to Treasurer Budget Chair Pam as he raises his concerns because they are serious concerns and I think they tell you that what you need to know. Thank you for listening to me. Ken, thanks for joining us tonight. Laura Drucker, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, this is Laura Drucker. I live um, in Amherst, District 1. Um, first, I wanted to respond directly to the co comments that Ira Brick submitted to the council and posted on the Indy on the 18th, where he said that you should, quote, inform yourself more by reading coverage in the Amherst Indy written by many intelligent Amherst neighbors. Not only is this completely patronizing and condescending to you all, but it is saying the quiet part out loud that he feels that the 18 or so people who according to their website regularly contribute to the Indy are more intelligent and their voice should matter more than the 3,231 people who in town who voted yes for the library last November, 64% of all ballots cast. Those 3,231 people did not vote yes because they saw the dollar amount listed on the ballot and thought it was something they could live with. They voted yes because they saw the opportunity for the town to get matching state funds to repair a failing building, get it off fossil fuels, and provide better services for our community. I am so disappointed that at the first sign of an obstacle, those who have been against this project from the start saw yet another opportunity to try and kill it. Instead, wouldn't it be great if Amherst came together and saw this obstacle as an opportunity to fight for more of what we need? An opportunity to fight for the state government to not allow towns 
to bear the brunt of record high inflation and supply chain shortages driving costs sky high. Why are we responsible for all of that increase? Let's push for Mandy and Joe to, Mindy, excuse me, and Joe to fight for us together with the other towns who I know are in the same situation. Let's take this opportunity with the historic federal climate legislation and the passes, passage of the Massachusetts climate plan to get all the funding we deserve to turn our library into a healthy fossil fuel free building. I know there are people in town who would love to help ensure the town gets all the funding it is due for this and the other three projects, not to mention all the other work needed to meet our climate goals. We can't let all this funding go to Eastern Massachusetts. As I understand it, the council can continue forward with the project as planned, which will allow us to understand the final cost numbers and make a final decision next year. We will likely spend 1.5 to $2 million in the next year to move this forward. Or we can pull the plug now and sink all the costs we have already spent. I implore you not to listen to a vocal minority and continue with the project. Let's take the time to look into these alternative funding opportunities. Let's take the time to push the state for more money. Let's see what happens with the inflation numbers. This seems like a small price to pay. And in fact, I can see, think of many examples where the town has approved funding of studies, fundings of groups to appease a vocal minority and that money went nowhere. I'd be happy to come up with $2 million worth. Um, so I just think we should stand, you know, I know this, I, I'm not trying not to be naive. I know this might not pencil out in the end, but let's not give up now. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Laura. I'm seeing no other hands at this time. And so we're going to continue on with the rest of our agenda. Um, we are moving to the consent agenda and um, let me, it's on your screen. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. I'm going to make the motion after I do that. If you would like to remove an item, please raise your hand and just ask that it be removed. Do not speak to why. And in addition to it does not require a second. So the motion is as follows to move the following items in the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. Waiver of the Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.6 for agenda item 6A 2022 National Suicide Prevention Week Proclamation. 6A, adoption of 2022 National Suicide Prevention Week Proclamation. 8D, adoption of proposed amendments to general bylaw 3.36 soliciting. 8A, approval of Eversource petition to install one fully owned Eversource pole on Pomeroy Lane between two existing poles. 9A, one to eight, approval of the following town manager appointments. Community Preservation Act Committee, Conservation Commission, Council on Aging, Local Historic District Commission, Public Art Commission, Public Shade Tree Committee, Recreation Commission, Resident Advisory Committee. 11A to D, approval of the following Town Council meeting minutes, July 18, 2022, Special Town Council meeting minutes, Public Forum on Community Preservation Act borrowing for ARHS track and field, July 18, 2022, regular town council meeting minutes, August 15, 2022, regular town council meeting minutes, September 12, 2022, regular town council meeting minutes. Mandy Jo? Um, I'm removing 8A, the Eversource petition. Okay. I'll, when I make the motion there, I'll make an amended motion. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, I know that there have been several versions of the Suicide Prevention Week proclamation. Does the motion she adequately cover the amended uh, petition that was uh, submitted later in the day? It does. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other comments, I'm going to move to the vote. I'll second the motion. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good idea. 
Um, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous. Um, we're moving to item six, which is in fact the suicide prevention week proclamation. And I've asked uh, Councillor Miller to read the last few paragraphs. Sure. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Amherst Town Council hereby proclaims September National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and states that it is committed to raising awareness about suicide prevention and will work with local public health and safety officials to ensure the community has access to adequate mental health resources. Be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council supports Bill S-250, an act adding a suicide prevention hotline number on student identification cards proposed by Senator Joanne Comerford, and Bill H-2081, an act to better coordinate suicide prevention services, behavioral health crisis care, and emergency services through 988 implementation and urges its legislative delegation to continue to propose and support legislation that raises awareness about suicide prevention, intervention, and training. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this proclamation to be sent to President Joe Biden, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey, Representative Jim McGovern, Governor Charlie Baker, State Senator Joe Comerford, and State Representative Mitty Dom. Thank you. Um, we are now going to move to, uh, there are no presentations and discussions tonight. We're going to move to action items. And Mandy Jo, I'm going to call on you to make the motion with regard to the Eversource petition as you would like to based on what we just heard. Okay. So to approve the order for poll location on Pomeroy Lane titled, quote, order for poll locations, quote, dated July 19, 2022, at the points indicated on the plan marked, oh, at the points indicated on the plan marked 80175930, and with the addition of the paragraph, quote, Eversource agrees to reserve space for one cross arm at a suitable point on each of said poles for the fire and police telephone signal wires belonging to the municipality and used by it exclusively for municipal purposes to the order. I second. Are there any questions? Comments? Going once. Okay. Uh, we're going to move to the vote. Lynn Griesmer votes aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Nika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Aye. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It's unanimous. Great. Did you call okay. me? Um, we are moving on to Anna says she didn't I didn't get call to on her. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Anna Devlin yeah, got I was, here. I was very excited to vote aye on that one. Thank you. That was an aye. Yeah. Thank you. Rotation doesn't always work for me. Thank you so okay. much. It is unanimous. Thanks. We are moving on to agenda item 7B, authorization for the town manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the town of Amherst and the Jones Library Incorporated. I'm going to begin this with a motion and then I'm going to move on for the finance committee report. The motion is to author to reauthorize the town manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the town of Amherst and the Jones Library Incorporated acting by and for its board of trustees with an addendum slash amendment 
that includes a bridging agreement for the time period prior to moving to construction. Is there a second? Second. And uh, Andy, since this was the subject of the entire finance committee meeting this past Tuesday, I'm gonna go ahead and ask for you to speak about that. And then I'm gonna call on Councilor Rooney. I'm not going to repeat what is in the report. Rather, I will respond to questions if they come up during the discussion about what is stated in the report. But I think that what I want to do instead is to kind of state on what the principles were that were part of the discussion and say a little bit about the process. Um, there were several principles we were applying. One is that we wanted to make sure that we understood the timeline of the process when the critical decisions have to be made. Second, we wanted to consider the financial needs of renovation and expansion proposal and repair alternatives because they are separate, but they both involve substantial cost. Third, we want to respect the elected Board of Library Trustees. We wanted to also respect our voters. And I'll pause for a second to just comment as an individual, not as chair, that it's rare that we have the opportunity to have a, a vote of voters expressing their perspective. And as previously noted, there was a substantial 65% that were voting uh, to proceed with the plan as it is uh, been proposed. And uh, basically for the financial obligation of the town, it's not changing at this point. Um, so the next two are we don't um, recommend decisions now that can be made later with more information, we would uh, we suggest postponing decisions until there is adequate information. And we want to assure clarity. We want to assure clarity for the town about the effect of immediate expenditures uh, made during the interim period before financial decisions um, must be made. And uh, applying those principles, we had a very robust discussion after receiving um, responses to um, questions and a tremendous amount of information that was provided by the trustees, library staff, and uh, by our town staff. So based upon that, we have made the motion that is before you tonight. And uh, I think that that's, uh, oh, I, the, the last thing that I wanted to say is that, I, just to comment on the process, because this was not obvious from the way the Finance Committee report is written. There was a motion made and passed, and um, it was passed on a um, divided vote, three to two amongst the uh, voting members. Another one of the members who voted in the majority raised the question, can we find a mechanism that or a motion that would uh, not have a divided vote? And based upon that, um, since it was somebody who is in a position to do so, she made a motion to reconsider and uh, the motion prevailed. We then returned to the motion and there was an amended motion that um, really addressed some of the concerns of all of the members of the committee, and we were able to have a unanimous vote. So the vote that is being presented to you tonight is with the unanimous recommendation of the Finance Committee. Thank you. Okay. I also wanna just note that there are many items in your packet, all of which were presented to the finance um, committee, uh, except for one that Sean Mangano has been able to get an update as of today. And that was regarding borrowing. 
Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions from counselors or comments. Uh, Kathy, you had your hand up. Pam, you had your hand up before her. Go to Kathy. Okay, Kathy. You need to unmute. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Um, I actually wrote out my comments, so, which is, uh, some of you know, is unusual for me. Um, I, I've i been um, actually losing sleep over this. Um, and when I, I go back to a year ago, I abstained on the project because I was worried that costs were underestimated and we were putting the town at financial risk. At that time, Lynn pledged the project would not get a dollar more than the 15.75 million general fund and 1 million CPA for, for the taxpayer share. And the trustees were committed to raising $5.7 million, not covered by the grant. With escalation and costs we're now seeing, I am not, I'm no longer worried, I'm terrified. Last week on the finance committee, I voted to recommend the addendum that Andy just described that would continue design to enable construction bids, assuming intensified fundraising effort. The estimated cost of this, as you heard from Bob Pam, would be 1.8 million. In the event we decide 15 months from now not to proceed, we will need to refund 2.2 million to the MBLC. The trustees have pledged they will reimburse the town for such costs or contribute to an equivalent amount in repair costs. The trustees remain optimistic that by some miracle, they will be able to secure 10 million more than their 5.7 million target or 16 plus million dollars. We might decide not to proceed if costs turn out to be high and the fundraising doesn't reach aspiration. The implicit goal is not to cost taxpayers more. Over the weekend, I realized that some valued fe features are being cut to reduce the project costs, as Bob Pam described. Notably, this kind of cutting happened in 1992 and contributed to the flawed 1993 addition to the Jones Library. This is no longer likely to be the project all those voters saw a year ago in design plans when they were assured it was affordable without jeopardizing other pressing needs. Trained as an economist, I poured over the cost analysis in light of the challenges I know we face as a town. After reviewing documents more thoroughly, I can no longer support the proposed motion that I voted on last week. Here are my main reasons. We would be putting the town at risk. Our town operating budget and capital budgets are already stretched with the need to finance a new elementary school, DPW and fire station. When I ran for council, I placed a priority on getting a new elementary school. This is now scheduled for a funding decision next spring. We need to protect our ability to support the school, and we need to protect funds to maintain other buildings and to invest in much needed road repairs. Second, we would be putting the library at risk. If the hope for fundraising does not materialize and we decide not to proceed, we will have lost 15 months and wasted 1.8 million of town or trustee funds. And we will be left without a concrete plan to replace the failed HVAC system, atrium roof or renovate. Third, and finally, the trustee funds will be depleted. While I welcome the trustees pledge to reimburse the town, this will hurt the endowment or donations raised to support the project. We need these refunds to repair and renovate the library. During the past several weeks, I've walked the library several times, looked through the windows of all the rooms. We have a large library, but it's clearly in need of repair and renovation. And it is at times underused. We can't afford to wait another 15 months if we don't believe we can really triple the fundraising goals, we will have lost time. Thus, I cannot support the motion to move forward. The risks are too high given the alarming $10 million or more gap in funding. I know this is unlikely to be a popular view, but I ran for council with a pledge to be a careful analyst, fiscally responsible, honest, and willing to make hard choices. As I said at the beginning, I've lost a lot of sleep over this choice, but I will be voting no. And I really hope that the trustees will return to the council with a plan to repair and renovate and move forward on a new path that will serve the town well and be affordable. 
Thank you very much. Um, if the motion does okay. pass, I'm Kathy. going to make a motion to that follow up motion. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to note that we did not start the clock at exactly when Kathy started speaking. So she went beyond three minutes. I ask other counselors to now stick to the three minute comment period. Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, Kathy made a lot of very good points. Um, I. I too would like to see a plan B developed, but I think um, I would like to be, uh, I would like to offer a friendly amendment to the motion that was put forward. I don't know the exact time when that wants to, to be discussed, but in general, I would like to explain why we might want to um, put some caveats on the, on the MOA for the town manager. Um, I think there's some caveats that are needed to build on what the trustees put in their motion, uh, that was, it was pretty appropriate. It, that um, what I'm looking for with my alternative or amendment is to have an earlier check-in point, so that the town manager um, brings to the table or asks to have brought to the table at the end of design development, rather than waiting until the end of construction documents to have and request a cost estimate at that time. So that would be in May. Um, I think um, fundraising should have pr proceeded by then. Um, it could be stated that, that if, the, uh, if the project is still too expensive for our ability to pay that at that time, at the end of design development, that we can then transition into the development of a plan B. Um, I think it doesn't save a lot of time, but it's it's clearly a good half year earlier that we would come to that decision point. So that's just the gist of it. And um, I look to Lynn to say when we wanna discuss the actual wording of an amendment. Okay, thank, thank you, you uh, for introducing the idea. I'm. First of all, I want to apologize, but I do want to note that Austin Surrett, the uh, chair of the library trustees, is with us as Alex Lefebvre is also uh, a member of the library trustees. There are several other library trustees in the audience, um, and Sharon Sherry, who is the director of the library, is also with us, uh, and Mindy Dom is listening. So... With that, I want to go back to Councillor Comments. Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. I mostly have a, a question. I think I know the answer, but I really need a clarification. Uh, when I read James Longgren's letter to the town about uh, delaying the second payment until the town signs a contract with a general contractor and secures a building permit, that seems to me to be beyond what the uh, MOU, uh, bridging MOU is saying, which I, this is where the clarification comes in, where we were saying um, till it goes out to bid. But here we're being told we have to have a building permit. And so I would like a clarification. I also want to say this is probably one of the most difficult decisions uh, I have been thinking about because I keep I keep moving from place to place on it. And I, um, so if someone could help me with understanding that a little bit more with more clarity, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I wanna note that Sean Manga Mangano, finance director has also joined us here this evening and I'm going to ask him to speak to the letter and the issue. Yeah, so they're sort of unrelated. Um, so the letter is just speaking to the timing of the MBLC payments. Um, normally, we would get one um, during at the end of construction documents, but not at the uh, opening of construction bids. Um, based on the latest schedule we've seen from the OPM, those are both slated to take place in FY24. We were hoping one of those would take place in FY23, which would get us an MBLC payment this fiscal year, but the latest schedule, they're both in FY24. So, um, so the letter does mean that that second grant payment from the state will be a little later than we were expecting, but it's not pushing it into a different fiscal year than what we would otherwise would have received it. Um, so that's sort of, that's just related to the timing of the MBLC grant payments. The MOU timing is sort of up to 
um, sort of a, to the town where you want to set it. We set it at construction bids because that's when we'll know the exact price. Um, that's when we'll actually receive bids from general contractors and know um, the exact amount for construction. So sort of unrelated, but around the same time. Pat, does that answer your question? Thank you. Dorothy Pam? Um, I would like to say that when uh, I voted and the people I know voted for the library, we were aware of the cost items in the, the uh, wording of the uh, thing we were voted on. We were not asked to give an emoji, a little heart emoji. We were told a certain process and a, uh, an amount. But I want to say that I've been thinking of stories of my youth in this discussion. And I see that right now we're in the little engine that could and Dumbo's magic feather, which is if I want something, if I really, really, really want it, it can happen. I can make it happen. But I remember then the years I spent during the Vietnam era where we were told we can't pull out. We've already cost us so much. We can't, even though everybody knew we were an absolute disaster and we had to stop. We didn't do it because of what we put into it already. Um, that war was based on some false premises uh, such as the domino theory and the strength of the allies. So the number is, the library plan is based on some false premises too. This is not the accurate number of people who live in this town, of the people who use the library. It is an inflated, not accurate number. So right now, the next story that I'm thinking of that just came to me yesterday was the O-rings. When you think of the Challenger and the, that we're gonna do a rocket launch and we're gonna put a school teacher in there, we're gonna have all the kids of America watch that rocket and where it's gonna be on a certain date and everybody wanted it, it was so exciting. And they didn't listen to the engineers. I mean, some people did, and they kept saying, you know, there's a problem with the O-rings. Nobody wanted to listen to the engineers because they weren't the big bosses. They weren't the people who were being colorful. They wanted that political moment. They wanted to do it. And we all, if unless you're very young, sat there and saw that thing blow up and the teacher be incinerated with the rest of the crew. So now we know that we have things that are being taken away. We're doing the value engineering. So I don't know what's going to be left. What had Kurt can help me vote? I voted yes. Reluctantly, I voted yes because I like the sawtooth design. I like the light coming in. I like the solar panels. I like the room for the Civil War stones. But we're now losing the sawtooth uh, windows and the solar panels. And I bet you we're going to find we're going to lose that Civil War room and go back to the library's original plan, which was put to put some of the stones in the hall. The, the plan is a bad plan. It has inflated the size of the library. It has, there's no green space around it. There's no outdoor learning space. And it really kind of looks like an inflated bouncy house in the, in the pictures that are sent to me to make me love it. So I, I tell you, that I'm, my last story is the one that I feel has been very central to my life. And that is the one that meant so much to me as a kid about the child that saw the emperor walking naked down the street. Everybody else is saying, oh, what pretty lovely clothes you have. But the child looked at it and said, mother, the emperor has no clothes. And I feel that that's true about this library plan. And if we keep going down the path of all of these things, we will be reliving many, many things that we have done in America. We'll be reliving things that may have been done in this town, but I think it's a waste and it's gonna end up not with a library that we need, not with a library that we want, and certainly not with a library we can afford. Mandy Jo. Wow. Um, our Jones Library is more than a library. It's a concert hall, it's a cultural center, it's a youth center and a children's center, an art museum, a community center. It's a place where people go to get warm in the winter, especially when their power goes out for a little bit. It's a place where people go to get cool in the summer, especially if they don't have air conditioning in their house. I have done it myself, both for warming and cooling. It is a place to go to get more than books. It is a place to rent a musical instrument, to rent a Wi-Fi hotspot if you don't have a large data plan on your cell phone or don't have high-speed internet at your house. It is a place to rent a tulip or bulb planter if you just want to do a little bit of gardening and don't have space to have, don't have money to buy gardening tools or space to store gardening tools. It's a place to get movies instead of paying for Netflix or Redbox or renting them from some other place. It is more than just a place to store books. 
Yet I think we seem to be forgetting that in this debate. We need this building and we need it for our community. It is disingenuous for people to say, well, let's just go back to the repair design because it'll be cheaper. But we know with the cost effects that we've seen rising from this plan and this proposal, that those repair costs that were going to be nearly identical will now be higher and there will not be MDLC money for that. We also know that um, that, that path forward then is likely not more fiscally responsible than the current plan of um, expansion and using the MBLC grant. Those repairs would not include climate sustainability improvements. And those improvements, if we wanted to include them that, would cost even more money than what the repair costs plus inflation would be. We need to be partners with our trustees. They were elected to determine what is best for the library. We were elected to determine whether there's money for it. They have said that they are willing to pick up the costs of the 2.2 million, and maybe some of that'll come from donations. And so it might not affect the endowment. We're the ones that need to say, yes, that's doable, let's go forward. Um, we can't forget that a library is more than just a library in this. And if we don't expand this library, and if we go just to a repair plan, we won't have a teen, a youth center. We won't really have a children's center because there's not really one now. That cultural center with those, um, with the Civil War tablets won't be there. The art museum will kind of be there. The community center will kind of be there, but we'll lose a lot if we don't expand. And a lot of stuff that we say we value in this town. Now is not the time to stop this project. Now is the time to join with our trustees and say, let's move forward to get this project done. At this point, there is very little risk to the town. I'm gonna to proudly support a continued MOU and the continuation of this project. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, I wasn't, wasn't sure if I was gonna speak, but I feel, I wanna say I agree with what Kathy said. And I also agree with everything Mandy said about what a library is to the town. I, the one thing we all agree on is we love the Jones Library. We may have different visions for how we think, what we think that library needs to meet the needs of the town, but the library is to all those things that um, you know, Mandy, Councillor Haneke just articulated. But I think that we can, the library can be everything it needs to be in its current square footage. It definitely, it needs work. It's need work for years. It needs to be maintained. It needs new carpet. It needs many things, but it doesn't need a larger square footage. At 60,000 square feet, that would be the ninth largest public library in Massachusetts. At 40,000 residents, we would be, we are the 48th largest town in the state, but our university and college students don't use the library. So for the purposes of the library, we have 19,000 card holders. I don't know where that puts us in state rankings at 19,000, but probably around 200. So I don't, I've never quite understood why we need to have the lar ninth largest public library to meet the needs of our community. Um, I, the, I, what I am struggling with is the trustees were initially committed when the voters went to vote and when the last town council, you know, voted in April of 2021, that they were going to raise $6 million. And, you know, that's a heavy, I thought that was a heavy lift, but I think the community thought it was doable. I, it doesn't feel right, actually, to put $15 million or more to expect that because the trustees could raise Six million, they could raise fifteen million, and in there was a chart that in the responses to Lynn Greismer's September eighth questions to the trustees, uh, one of the responses I think it was on page fifteen. There was a chart that the library provided, and I, if I'm remembering correctly, the low cost estimate of like forty six point nine million dollars was going to require the trustees to raise seventeen point two million dollars. 
the high estimate, which was if the library came in at like $53.3 million, was going to require the trustees to raise, I think, $23.6 billion. I, I think that's not fair to ask of the trustees, and I think there's no world in which that is realistic. And I know, you know, as Councillor Haneke said, we should follow the advice of our trustees. And with all due respect, I, the treasurer of the trustees is cautioning us, you know, not to keep going down this path when we have, we know that the library, it's very unlikely that when the bids come in, they will be less than $15 million more than what was before the voters and it could well be higher than that. Thank you. Anika. Uh, yes, I just, uh, I wanna speak um, in regards to uh, the Civil War tablets um, that I hope will not be politicized as they are probably one of the first true diverse acts that the town will do. Um, if included in the library, they would be the first time that within any town building, the true history of Amherst has been inclusive, meaning that you have over 300 names of Amherst area residents who were innovative and believed in pushing uh, freedom for forward uh, taking steps towards equality for all, but you also do have um, the Black and the Afro-Indigenous families, and this would be the first time within the walls of the Jones Library or any other town building um, that that true fabric of Amherst history is inclusive. And as this is a first and hasn't been done, the potential uh, funding around that is unknown. Will that, you know, will that solve the problem? I can't say that. But I just think that we should um, as well give some trust and support behind the trustees and, you know, look, there may be other avenues that haven't been looked at for their uh, duality um, or potential value as they could support the project and while protecting our taxpayers. Um, thank you, Anika. Um, Austin, you have your hand up. And even though you're not a counselor, you are the chair of the trustees. So please go ahead. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I really appreciate the care with which the council is engaged in this conversation. I, I think there's some things though that need to be said. Uh, the library has no chief financial officer. All the trustees have a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, we all invest in trying to understand the finances of the library. I respect all of the trustees. Uh, but I don't think we should imagine that this is kind of a corporation with a chief financial officer and the rest of us know nothing about the finances. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, whatever it is that you decide and however we construct the vote of the citizens of Amherst, I think one thing was clear from that vote. And that is that the citizens of, of, of Amherst endorsed the vision of the library. What was the vision of the library? The vision of the library was that after a very long process of careful study, the board of trustees of the library a long time ago examined what could be done within the existing footprint. And the trustees along with the staff determined that in order to meet the needs of the residents of Amherst for generations to come, the existing footprint did not provide enough space. What does that mean? That means within the existing footprint, we have a children's room on three levels. It would be nice to have a children's room on one level. That means within the existing footprint, English as a second language cannot be accommodated except by spreading it all over the, all over the library. That means there is no teen space. That means there's not adequate space for people to come into the library and use computers. That means there's not an adequate reading room. So I, I don't think uh, we can say that we can satisfy the needs of the residents of Amherst within the existing footprint. If we, if we could, we wouldn't be doing this. Why else might, might the citizens of Amherst have voted for this? They might have voted for it, not because of the sawtooth roof design. And by the way, the nostalgia for that sawtooth roof design is really kind of wonderful for me to hear because 
Uh, it was criticized, of course, when it was first uh, advanced. But if, but again, uh, I've read books about memory and uh, as, as well. Uh, what else can't be done in the existing library? The existing library cannot be made environmentally sustainable without, in essence, kind of tearing it down and going back to, um, to ground zero. The citizens of Amherst, I hope, voted for historic preservation. The citizens of Amherst voted for the construction of a library facility that would belong to all the residents of Amherst. That wouldn't be just comfortable for people who are used to coming into a library where there are eight staircases, many of them lead to nowhere. Now, uh, this is not a wish and a prayer. This is not the triumph of hope over experience. This is actually the triumph of experience. We've looked at what's happened to libraries elsewhere. We see what happens when libraries are renovated and expanded and how it enlivens the town. What we're asking the town council to do is to go forward with planning. We've looked at whether or not we think that makes sense to go forward with the planning. We've been told by the OPM who works for the town that given the uncertainties which are faced by all construction projects right now, that it makes sense to go to bid and to see where we are, uh, see where we are then. Lastly, the trustees are a very prudent bunch. And the image that we're just gonna go to our endowment and write a check out of our endowment to the town and therefore not be able to operate the library, I think is the wrong image to have. We will, and we have begun to put together a careful plan for how, if we have to pay for uh, this design and, constru and construction uh, documents, how we'll do it without compromising the operating expenses of the, of, of, of the library. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Austin. And I just want to mention that I know Austin has a class he needs to get to. So if he disappears, it's not for lack of his interest in the topic. It is because he has responsibilities as a professor. Anna. Thank you. I apologize. I have one hand wrangling a dog who barks at thunder. So um, sorry if y'all hear that in the background. So I, uh, I was not alive for the Vietnam War, nor was I alive for the Challenger explosion. Sorry about that. And I believe the Emperor's New Clothes is fiction, uh, from my understanding. But, uh, and, and also illegal, I think, based on our bylaws. But what I do now, and what I did do, is I borrowed books about those from the Jones Library. I borrowed Nova episodes when I was a kid and loved and still do love PBS from the Jones Library. I would go to do my homework there after high school, waiting for my mom to finish work and pick me up. I finished my master's thesis in the basement of the Jones Library. Uh, this is TMI and I apologize. I was on a date with a graduate of UMass who put her keys on my counter and I saw a Jones Library tag on those keys. And I asked her, because we're in the middle of this, I said, you had a Jones Library card when you were at UMass? And she said, oh yeah, it was where I could go that wasn't school. It was where I could go to borrow books that I wanted to read on my own time. The library in its current state shows up for so many people in so many ways. And yet, because of its deteriorating condition, because of its lack of accessibility, because of the way that you, you can barely have a conversation in the Woodbury room because that dang blower is so loud, it is not showing up the way we need it to. It is not showing up for every member of our community as much as it could. We keep finding ourselves in this trap of the grass being greener. The repair option is not greener grass. People will say that the services could be split up and moved to school buildings that have yet to be vacated that are not in suitable shape without consideration for costs of doing that, nor consideration for the folks who engage with these programs who have identified that they don't want them in a school. This is a rough spot and no one is denying that. The grass is not greener and the trustees have shown their plan. We do listen to the advice of our experts and we listen to the advice of our trustees. And with all due respect, 
The treasurer is not the only person with financial acumen and awareness that's in that group. The library trustees who are voted by our community have themselves voted on this issue. We are not placing an irresponsible ask on the trustees. They have asked for it themselves. We need to trust them to know and do their jobs. So I hope my fellow counselors will join me in voting yes, in reaffirming again, the will of the voters, in committing to our work in reducing fossil fuel emissions and our, and our dependence on fossil fuels, in not waiting around for costs to continue to rise and in trusting the very group of people that we have elected to guide the library and in trusting our community. Please vote yes, thank you. Jennifer, I'm gonna skip over you since you've spoken already and go to Shalini. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to three uh, things that I'm hearing, risks, the word miracles and the library vision. And the risk factor is huge, we all know that. And as I'd stated last time, that is what the MBLC process, any state process is. So by backing away at this point, what we're signa signaling to MBLC and all the other state grants is that we apply, we win the grants, and then we back away. We never ever give it a shot of working through or getting to the point where we can make a more informed decision. So maybe we should as a council discuss that and not apply for state grants because that's just how the state grants are going to work, that there will always be a gap. So that's one thing. The second thing is the risk of postponing till we have a better plan. Again, we can learn from the schools, which are paying now $35 million more. The town, that's the whole, that could have been the whole cost of the library, which we said no to, and we're losing that. Um, we lost that because we walked away from it. The cost of repairs, we have to bring that into the conversations when we're talking about the risks right now. The cost of repairs have also gone up, and we, I want all the counselors to speak to that. Who, how are you factoring that in? to your decision. So I haven't heard uh, people talking about that. The same thing that I want to talk about with the library vision. So there are tr elected trustees who are elected to cr create the vision based on the needs assessments. There is a process. The MBLC process factors in the students year round uh, and the seasonal population, that's all factored in when they arrive at what is the square footage. And so it's not something that trustees came up with, but it's based on a formula. And so they did the work, they've been working hard at it for several years, whether we agree or disagree at this point, yes, there was a disagreement, it went to the residents. So 65% of the voters have also supported that vision. So when we talk about, we personally may have different visions, but our job is to respect the work and the vision of the people who are responsible for guiding us in this, which is the library trustees and also the 65% of the residents. The third thing is I've heard the word miracles. That word miracles basically is a job of people called fundraising. What, when we have not done fundraising, it does sound like a miracle. How are we gonna raise that much money? But they're actually, people who have that experience, that's their job, is to find the money in the right places, just like we heard the Epsilon Group has raised $17 million in federal historic preservation tax. And that's the group that's working with us. We have state rep who's Shani, supporting us. Yes, and so what, what I'm saying is, yes, it's hard, but we have a group of specialized people to get institutional ARPA money grants and to let's give it a full shot and let's all work together, collaborate. And that's gonna make our town stronger because we've been through this challenge together. Thank you. So I'm going to use my privilege as an individual counselor and make my own statement. We are at the beginning, and I do mean the beginning of a tough, capital process. We have four buildings that we have ignored, actually five buildings, and we're going to combine one of them into two, two of them into one school. And so I look at this and I say, oh, does this mean every time we approach some bumps in the road, we're going to start backing off? 
or do we do what I was taught to do? And that is when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that's what I've been doing for the last several weeks since this number first came out. I'm willing to stand up to the state and say, oh, remember that COVID incident we had that set our economy on its tail? I'm willing to go out and talk to other towns that are having the same problem. What I'm not willing to do is give up some level of vision for our town and our future, for our downtown and our future. And so as much as I am a fiscal conservative and a fiscal realist, I am also an optimist. My mother used to call me an optimist and say something that I won't even repeat in this meeting. But you have to be tough and you have to be realistic. Thanks. Andy. I think you said a little bit of what I was gonna to say too. I think that the voters understood what they were voting for. They understood that they were voting for essentially a repair of the building that exists now and the footprint it is, and might be able to get a little bit of more space, but it's not going to be more efficient. It's not going to be um, any more user friendly. It's not going to have all sorts of little hidden places that make some people feel uncomfortable, that it's sort of a warren as it is now or that they could have a really brand new state-of-the-art library that would serve the 21st century and beyond. And I think that they made a choice. I'm optimistic that it can succeed, but I don't know that it can succeed. Um, but I also recognize that the other side of it, the flip side is that if we decide not to go forward, there will be no second chance that we're not gonna be back in the MVLC line. We will have spent our money on repairs to a building without any uh, new program possibilities um, with it, that have been adequately described already about state-of-the-art children's room, state-of-the-art teen room, uh, space for ES, ESL programs, all of those things will will not be there and there will be no second chance to come back. We will have spent our money. We will have spent our goodwill with MBLC and uh, we will not have changed MBLC's policies that have um, affected choices that we've had to make. But I think we've made them, our trustees have made them and I really respect that they've made them wisely. So I don't, uh, I think that the choice at this point is to respect our voters and try and make it succeed. If it doesn't, it won't be for the lack of trying. Um, I've been excited about some of the things that have been happening, but they're not, I don't have time to go into all of it right now. Um, there's been good participation from our legislators. There's been good participation that, um, from very many parties in our community parties and partners. So uh, just don't think that there's a second chance. Pam, do you want to go ahead and make your substitute motion or you're trying to amend? Uh, it's, I think I'm trying to add to, I don't know if mine is a complete motion in its, in its uh, own right but I would like to proceed with that. I think the conversation tonight has, has indicated there's a clear will on many people's part to proceed. And I'm saying, if we are to proceed, can we please put in a few more checkpoints to get that feedback, to get a better financial picture than you know, going the full 13 to 15 months down the road before we get an answer to some of these questions. Um, do you have it available to put on the screen or shall I just read it? Why don't you read? I mean, you did send me a motion. I gave you some suggestions, but it's not my motion. So you have to okay. decide. 
and and I did not get your suggestions. I, I apologize. Oh, so sorry. Um, um, my motion is motion that the town council authorize the town manager to amend the memorandum of agreement voted on April 5, 2021 by and between the town of Amherst and the Jones Library incorporated acting by and through its trustees whereby the omitted MOU serves to address and assign responsibility for the renovation expansion projects cost through the completion of design development and that's the change documents at which time an updated cost estimate and risk analysis is presented to town council for consideration and in the event a decision is made not to proceed with the project when the design development cost estimate is presented, the trustees will reimburse the town for its share of the cost incurred in design development and pledge to invest whatever funds were raised and pledged for the renovation expansion project be assigned to continue the preparation of construction documents and bidding for a plan B reuse and repair project. And in that event, that the project does not proceed at that time, a plan B alternative for a design that reuses, repairs, and renovates to a modest degree the existing library structure to meet ADA requirements and improved energy efficiencies is initiated at that time to develop a schematic design and cost estimates for plan B, and that this agreement will specify the time period for the completion of any payment to the town, investment by the library, and capital improvements or other means to ensure that the ta that the costs are otherwise covered. And if I could just speak to that for a moment. Uh, we, no, we need a second before you can speak to it. Okay. This is Thank not a, this is not the same motion that we had. So I, Athena, should we consider it as a substitute motion? It sounds like Councilor Councilor Rooney is looking to amend the motion by replacing it in its entirety. Okay, thank you. And so uh, we will now look for a second. Jennifer, you have your hand up. A second. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go back to Pam to speak to the motion. <clears throat> As I said earlier, the the MOU that was developed by the trustees is very much in the same vein. I am simply asking that in order to proceed, which many people clearly want to be doing tonight, that we put in a, a, an additional checkpoint, and that being at the end of design development. So in construction document preparation or in, in, the, in the design process, we go through schematic design, which has just been completed. We then go to design development, and from there it is approved and we go into construction documents. So I'm saying we stop and we ask for a cost estimate at that time of design development. The OPM works for the town. The OPM can request that cost, that cost estimate. At that point, we're, and again, we're now in May, at that point, we will have a much better handle on uh, fundraising success. We'll have a better sense of of um, grants and other funding in hand. And I would just offer that this is an opportunity to proceed, but at, with caution. Thank you. Mandy Jo, and I, there's a couple of facts in here that I wanna check, but I'm gonna go over to council comments. So I have some questions and some comments. So I don't think this is simply a check um, or a check on the process or a new check is at, at the wording that Pam used is blanking in my mind right now, an additional stop. Um, and here's why, and this is where I want some questions answered. Um, I believe cost estimates cost every time we do them. And I'm not sure the design development stage is when we do an, an additional cost estimate. I'd, I'd like to confirmation as to when a second another cost estimate would be done whether that is normally done after de design development and before construction documents or not because i believe every time we do one of them we add money to our costs in terms of project costs um but then this the continued paragraph is 
having telling the trustees that they will pledge to invest whatever funds were raised and pledged for the renovation expansion project to be assigned to continue the preparation um, and bidding for a plan B reuse and repair project. Um, it is my understanding that the pledges and funds that have been donated have been donated solely for the MBLC project. And if that project does not go forward, each individual donor is able to decide whether to request a refund of their pledge and gift or allow it to stay with the trustees so that the trustees cannot pledge to invest whatever funds were raised for the renovation expansion to a plan B reuse and repair. And so I have, that's why I say this is not just a motion to have a checkpoint at design development because it's asking for things that I do not believe can we can legally tell the trustees to do right now. Um, you know, that those are some of my initial thoughts that I'd like confirmation or or discussion on. Um, and thank you. I'm gonna ask Sean uh Mingana, you've asked some of the questions I was Sean, when will the next estimate be available? And what is the what point in the project is that? So let's take let's take this down for the moment, please. Yeah, so I'll have to confirm uh, with the OPM. My understanding was it was at 75% of construction documents. Um, and Sharon, I don't know if you have talked and spoken more with the OPM, um, but in looking back at um, looking back at the solicitation we did for cost estimating services, it does. Uh, we should actually have one during design development. I don't know if it's yeah. at the end of design development or where where in that phase it comes into because it was before the before we've redesigned the schedule a little bit. So I'd have to talk to the OPM more to find out the timing of where that comes in in design development. Okay. And my other question is, um, I can actually answer, and that is, Mandy Joe, you were absolutely correct. People gave for the purposes of the um, plan as it was put forward, and should that plan not go forward, it would it is behooving upon the library trustees and to go back and say, do you want to be refunded or continue your pledge or not? Uh, and under, with the understanding that we are not going to give you what we promised when we raised that money. So um, the council cannot legislate what happens to those pledges. Um, Pam, I'm going to go to Anika and then to Jennifer and then come I, back. I was just gonna respond to that particular point. Oh, please go ahead. Okay, um, thank you, Sean, for the for the design development. I mean, that is that is often a at the end of DD is often a very key uh, spot. I worked in construction management for um, about thirty years, so it is it is a key point where you double check your numbers and you proceed with caution. Um, the the wording about putting uh, putting money back into the repairs if the project is voted to not go forward, I think came from some of the trustees language itself, which is why I borrowed it. Thank you. I didn't, they didn't specifically say to plan B, but they just did say that it would go back into the repairs and, and work in the building. And the solicitation for um, the cost estimating does say the end of design development. Yep. Great. Uh, Anika. Oh, please. Some of uh, the majority of, of my comments have been asked or answered. And um, so I do appreciate, um, Pam, you know, the, your efforts of being protective. But my question is, if we're, if, seeing as we're advised by the OPM to go forward to the bid process, what consequence or expense, expenses would we occur by um, having another check-in and would we have any additional information at that point? Because with my understanding, we will not. Sean, can you answer that question? So um, we'll have another cost estimate, which will tell us if it, you know, if the, the range of um, range of figures have changed. Uh, so if it's changed wildly, that would, that would be something to influence the decision-making. Um, We'll have another 
uh, I think the end of design development, looking at the schedule here, is around April of 2023. Um, so we'll have seven or eight months more of possible fundraising um, uh, initiatives to see how that's doing. So I don't think there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of new information, but there, there will likely be some. Jennifer? Uh, yes, my um, two questions. Um, so is it possible, I guess the way I read the wording in Pam's amendment was like the current motion that the finance committee voted on, which is just that if at the next, if at whatever point a decision might be made not to go forward, that that is when the, what the library would reimburse for, not necessarily from um, charitable donations. Uh, so it would just mean that if a decision was made at the end of design um, development that, and it was a decision not to go forward, that would just be a smaller amount of money that the library would be reimbursing the town for, or I guess the way the motion reads from the finance committee or apply that amount towards repair and renovation. So I'm wondering if the language does it read that way now in the amendment, could it? Um, the other question I had was, I thought I had seen someplace that there was gonna, that there would be two cost estimates presented at the end of each phase. So wouldn't there be cost estimates done at the end of design development? I guess that's a question to Sean. Yeah, and no, there, we, there is, there's a cost estimate at the end of design. There may, the way it was with schematic design is there's one by the, owner's cost estimator and there's one by the designer's cost estimator and then they they choose they come to a sort of midpoint between those two cost estimates and there will be one at the end of design development and there will be one at 75 percent of construction documents which right. is the, so the following gonna... phase right so it, it wouldn't add anymore right it's already part of the the plan right. so that seems simple and i just wanted i don't want just because it, i just want to correct it i wasn't um in my remarks before i wasn't saying that the footprint shouldn't be changed at the library. My concern is just so much additional square footage, not the footprint. Thank you. Alex, uh, you have your hand up. And so I'm gonna call on you because I think you may have some answers to some questions. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Um, so uh, Sean's answered a couple of them. So yes, at the end of each phase, we get two cost estimates, one from um, the, OPM, well, one from Feingold, one from the designer's cost estimator and one from the towns. So what we just got now will happen again at the end of design development, then again at construction documents. And then um, the other thing, which I believe maybe Joe and Lynn both clarified is, so we, yes, we, we can't pledge uh, money that's been raised because it's been raised to a purpose. Whether people do that, that would be great. But again, we, we, we can't put that in the commitment. Um, what the what the what the library trustees voted on was specifically to take to the bidding process. So from for us, every time we stop the process, like we have done now, we are escalating costs, which we are, are taking on in terms of fundraising. So to create another stopping point after design development, then again starts the escalation again and again and again. And the reason to get to bid is that once the numbers have been bid, then those numbers are locked in. And then we can then have a conversation about, so then going back to town council and having that conversation about what, what's additional funding, does it make sense? We're no longer escalating our cost. So every stopping point is really making it harder and it's making the probability of this uh, less. So every week we delay, every time we stop the process is essentially making it more difficult for us, both in terms of uh, people giving money to a project that they don't know whether it's gonna go forward or not, in terms of us applying for state and federal grants in which there might be certain uh, things that we have to meet or timelines that we have to apply by, or you know, we don't even know if we can keep the money. So it, it just, it, it adds additional roadblocks into the process for us. Um, the other thing, so for us, I mean, I, I speak, our language says to bid, it doesn't say to design development. So we would have to go back and we would have to vote on that if we do something differently. Um, the other thing, you know, I, 
you know, we're sort of litigating the size of the library, which, you know, I, that was litigated through town, right? We know we need a bigger library, right? We all talk about experts. All of our librarians, all of our head librarians have masters in library science degrees. This is what they do for a living. So I, as a trustee, have to defer somewhat to my staff and to my library director who are all professionals in the field. When they say that they are unable to accommodate the needs of our public based on our current square footage, um, my responsibility as a trustee is to listen to the professionals who are doing their jobs. Um, and they're the ones on the front lines who actually watch people come in. They know who gets turned away. They know who they're not able to take care of. So I, I hope that we can not focus the conversation on, do we need a bigger library or don't we need a bigger library? Because I think that decision has already been voted on by the town. The real conversation here needs to be, how do we move forward? How do we roll up our sleeves? How do we work together? We have state legislators, we have federal legislators. The difference with the fundraising, and I'm, in it, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I first saw that number and it was two weeks of me not sleeping. I mean, I, in no way did I go, oh, that's fine, we'll do that. I was very freaked out. But we have professionals who fundraise for a living who are helping us with this. We've got all of our legislators helping us with this. And um, we keep finding money, right? We keep finding money because we are at a point in our country where you've got COVID, you've got infrastructure bills, you've got sustainable money. So there are, there, is, there are dollars that will go to a renovation expansion that we're never gonna see in a repair. So when people say that we can just take the money that we're raising and put it into a repair, I would urge you to really, really be, be cognizant that we can't just roll out a repair and, and find dollars for it. I feel much more confident that I can, we can raise 10 to $15 million for a renovation and expansion, then I feel I can raise 5 million for a repair. And I really want you to hold that differential in your mind because it's really different what we can do for one versus the other. And I will be quiet now because I'm not supposed to be speaking anyway, so I apologize. Thank you. I, um, Mindy Jo, if it's okay, I'm gonna go to Michelle since she's not spoken on this. Michelle? Thanks. Um, yeah, I. This is a really tough decision, I think, for all, all of us. And it's very um, complicated in some ways. And um, I really appreciate Pam's efforts to bring something forward that potentially could, for me, I, I am a yes on this. I am 100% a yes. And so whatever we need to do in my mind to get us um, over the hump here as a council, I'm willing to stay up all night and, and figure out a way to do that. I know Lynn probably doesn't like that <laughs> idea, but, um, you know, uh, in, in, I'm very motivated normally by emotional, um, commentary. I'm normally the one that's making it. And um, Mandy's comments, uh, you know, and others who have made emotional arguments have been very good. Um, but in this case, to me, it, it's really about principle. And this process, it's, it's not just in my mind to stop this process right now. There are so many people that have put so much work into this and the community that has spoken really clearly about this. And so whether I think that we'll be successful or not, or we'll raise enough money or not, or whether the libraries is, uh, you know, a place for all of the residents, um, you know, all of that, in my mind, I, I'm sort of having to push that out and just really focus on the fact that this is a process and to pause the process right now before we even know what the cost of the library is going to be does not feel just or fair to me. And I don't think we have a lot to lose in allowing the process to continue. And I worry about the precedent that we will set 
um, for the other projects that we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and work really hard to get through. If every, you know, time we're, this is, this is going to be our reality. We're going to hear cost increases. We're going to hear unpredictable markets. We're going to hear all of these things. Um, and we have to get used to that reality. And so I don't know if this project will ultimately go forward in the way that Michelle just to froze play out. Okay. Sorry. Um, am I still frozen? But no, you're fine. Thanks. Okay. I'm unstable <laughs> according to my uh according to my computer. But I, I just I feel like it it we really have to allow the process to go forward um and and play out and and get to the point where we can then really make a sound decision about whether this uh envisioned um plan is is going to be feasible for us. So thanks. Mindy Joe, I'm going to go ahead and have you speak, and then I want to go back and just review where we are and the process. Hi. Okay. Um, I'm just going to build on what Michelle said. So I believe Pam Rooney's motion is a motion to amend the original motion. And so if that is the case, I will be voting against Pam Rooney's motion and in favor of the original motion. Um, I'm always hesitant to dictate terms, exact terms to our town manager who we've hired to administer this town. Um, and so the, the motion that's in front of us to amend includes a whole lot of language that gets really specific that I just don't, that I'm first of all, some of it just can't work and others of it I think is just too specific. And much of it could be incorporated um, it is not precluded from being incorporated into the original motion, into, into the MOU if the original motion passes. Um, what Michelle said about limping forward stage by stage, um, you know, the original motion would get us through to construction documents. Uh, Councillor Rooney's motion would only get us one stage further, and then we'd be back here talking again, pausing the project, still not creating certainty for the fundraisers who have a whole lot and a large job to do. And if they can only go and say, well, in six months, we'll be asked to get, the council might kill it again or might talk about it again, versus if they can say, we will know in one year and give them a full year to come up with the money, to come up with those funds, having that certainty that they've got a year versus five or six months can be huge in a fundraising um, manner. And so I, I, I don't support limping along stage by stage, you know, we're going to go the second, the first motion, the original motion gets us two stages in advance. And I think it's much better to do that and sets, if we're going to talk about setting precedent, sets a much better precedent than if we continually as a council vote at the funding stage and then vote at the schematic design and then vote at design development and vote at construction documents. Imagine what that means for a school, you know, and trying to get a school that's estimated at this point, probably over a hundred million dollars to construction on time. Um, it will be extremely difficult. And so I think we have to say, you know, Let's step back, let the people do their job, and let's see this again at construction for serious conversation. We'll see the numbers at design development from what Sean said. If things go wildly out of control between now and then, this first motion doesn't stop us from seeing that and doesn't stop us from relooking at it, but it doesn't require us to if things are looking better. And so I, I'm, I can't support Pam Rooney's motion, but I will support the original. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Yes, I just want to mention something that caught my eye and then I did not like it. We're dis discussing a decision that the town manager is going to make. And at the same time, we also, oh, we're gonna look over the town manager goals. I felt that that was in effect some kind of pressuring of him. I want to trust that the town manager can make this decision with all of uh, his intelligence and knowledge of the world and government and systems and not have to be thinking about the town council saying, oh, we're going to do your goals because, you know, we hire you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Alicia, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to share um, some of my thoughts around this topic, which I know is very challenging. Um, and originally during the finance committee, um, I did not support the first proposed motion because I didn't feel like it had enough safeguards uh, for the town, which we are in a very tight financial spot trying to accomplish all of our capital projects. And so I thought that the amendment that Kathy offered uh, provided more safeguards to as to what we had before. Um, I, however, believe that Pam's motion has brought that even a step further, providing us more safeguards um, in terms of our financial situation. Um, and so I also respect the comments about pausing and the process and how long some of these things take. Um, and I know that makes this even more difficult when we think about how long we've already been working on this project. Um, but I think we also need to think about the urgency of the repairs, which is something that we also talk about and how detrimental it would be to the library ultimately to wait a significant amount of time and then decide that the bids were too high and not have an alternative plan. Um, and I think that is far more risky than just moving forward, seeing what can happen. And then if we were to get to that point in 16 months and then say, we're too high, we don't have a plan B, we have to start over, that would be far more risky than if we had a plan B already in formulation at the time. And so I do support the forming of a plan B, of a backup plan, because I mean, we're already talking about the numbers and about being worried about the numbers. And so we're at, if we're in a place where the only change we're expecting to see is an escalation. I think it only makes sense to have another alternative option so that we're not saying it's either this or nothing. We do this or our library falls apart. Like I think we need to still have some protection, not only for our town, our town finances, but for the library itself. And so I think that this provides that protection without stopping the project, which is how we find the happy medium here because like other counselors have said, there is overwhelming support for this project on the council and a lot of people don't want it to stop, but we have to, we have to be cautious of our financial position as a town. We have to be cautious as to how this library project needs to fit kind of like a puzzle piece into the other capital projects, which we also have yet to have the numbers for. So not only are we waiting for the numbers for the library project itself, but we have a number of other projects which we have no cost estimates for yet either. And so for locking in such a huge decision without any safeguards or any plan B that if this doesn't work out, we have something that will still bring our library up to the spot where it can meet the needs of our community. I think, I think that is financially irresponsible. Again, because like we said, not only will the costs of construction as um, escalate, but so might the cost of repair. And so why wait to have that backup plan? Because then we are then dragging that out as well, if we get to the point where that needs to be the option. Um, Alicia, you, so, need to clear, you need to clear. Yes, thank you. Did, did you have any last comment you wanted to make, Alicia? Uh, well, I had a couple of more, but if, since I'm already over, I can just end it there because I will talk for like three more minutes if you let me keep going. So, <laughs> Okay, let's go on to Andy. Yeah, I, we already do have a plan B uh, with the work that Western Builders and Coon Riddle have already done. It may not be exactly what happens, but it's certainly the put the, the direction to go forward in because we know what work has to be done. It's been identified a long time ago by Western Builders and studied by Coon Riddle, costed by Coon Riddle. Coon Riddle has come through with a couple of plans of how we could proceed to handle it in a the most cost-effective manager from a firm that manages projects all of the time. That's what they do as a business. So I think that we have the plan B. I think that what scares me about this whole discussion is that the reason I was so enthusiastic about the result that came out of the finance committee meeting 
was that the library trustees had put forth a vision of what we, we could accomplish um, if we all worked together and we did the work of, of fundraising, we did the work of a thoughtful um, continuation of the design process. We looked at how we could uh, make value engineering decisions in the design process and how we can work with the legislature and um, both federal and state to get more support. And all of those things were gonna be able to come together at the end of the process that was um, envisioned as a single piece of time and we'd be able to make a decision. It's scary because the decision at that time might be, we can't afford to go through with it. But on the other hand, it, um, the optimistic side is, it will be possible to go through with this. And I'd like to believe that the second is possible um, and is in fact, um, more than just a pipe dream, that there's a real possibility and, uh, of it happening. So I guess that my concern about um, the motion that's on the table to substitute um, is going to create a process that is so long and so delayed that we can't possibly succeed and we'll be forced to go to that plan B, which isn't the plan we want. It's the plan we um, have as a backup if, if the real plan, the plan the voters supported fails. So my comment at this point is as a counselor, I do not support the uh, substitute motion. And the reason I don't support the substitute motion and support the original one is because I believe in order for us to truly have a grasp on what the possibilities are between now and next summer, fall. First of all, we need to get through the supplemental cycle with the legislature. There's at least one of those, it's active right now. Second of all, we need to get through the federal budget, which doesn't conclude, if we're lucky, it concludes at the end of September, unless we go into continuing resolution because there's money that Jim McGovern has been working on, Congressman McGovern. The, in addition to that, a six month or seven month fundraising period with a hatchet hanging over your head doesn't do anything for fundraising. I've done fundraising in this town as have several other people on this committee. It doesn't help. What we really need is to get behind the fundraising. We need to wait to see if we are successful with the legislature and the state government and the various other pieces as well. So the timing of trying to make this as an incremental decision every time there's a new estimate is bad policy and it's going to do nothing more than add increased costs and furthermore erode any trust MBLC has in us at this point and erode the trust of our population. Um, Michelle, I, I do want to say we have a motion on the table. If we now have a substitute motion on the table, we have to vote on the substitute motion. If the substitute motion fails, we go back to the original motion. If the substitute motion passes, then we do not go back to the original motion. Point of order. Yes. It's not you. a substitute motion. It's a I, motion to amend. Motion to amend. Thank you. So if the motion to amend fails, the original motion's on the table. If the motion to amend passes, you still have to re-vote again on the motion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mandy Jo. The other thing that I also want to mention, and I and I appreciate Dorothy's comments, this. The goal was to give the town manager, whom we pay full time, to negotiate all kinds of contracts. That's part of his job. It's part of the charter's description of what he does. And he needs to be the person that we trust to go forward to negotiate an agreement with the library trustees. When we start putting in details about who's gonna pay what to whom and when they're gonna do it, that means we don't trust him to in fact 
negotiated an agreement. And yet he signs many contracts all the time. Michelle? I'm wondering if Pam um, may be satisfied with an alternate plan um, for having sort of getting the security that you're looking for. So for example, um, would some internal like council work, like having this on the agenda once a month to, and sorry, Lynn, I'm hold on, just bear with me a second. <laughs> um, but just having some other checkpoints within the council um, that don't slow the process of the trustees and the work, but that give us an opportunity to check in? Or is there any, maybe that's not the right solution, but is there another solution that would get you more to where you would like to be and allow you to confidently vote to move forward with the original motion? And maybe there's not, but I'm just I'm posing it as a question. I'm, I'm just going to say right now, the moment you put something on the agenda once a month, everybody thinks you're going to have action. And it means that it, it's micromanaging. And I'm just going to say to Kathy, to Alicia, who are very central to our school committee, is this the way you want us to do the school building? Once a month, we have to discuss the costs? Well, I'm, I'm not suggesting once a month that we suggest the cost. I'm just simply suggesting, is there something else that might help Pam to feel more confident that we're going to be evaluating this, um, not waiting for a whole year? You know, I, I just want to say there is a building committee and there are trustees. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that uh, Pam, you, maybe you have some comment you'd like to say to that, but there's two other committees that are watching this thing as part of their regular assignments. Pam, I'm just gonna go out of order for the moment. I think, I think I'm think i just ready to proceed and have people um, you know, respond to this. I think it was an attempt to work with the trustees motion and to simply give the town manager a little more uh uh i'm not not backbone but just a, a reason to ask for some additional information and to be a little more forthcoming with with what the uh what the option might be should the cost still be so extraordinarily out of whack in seven months time so it was not meant as a as a crippled or a shackle or anything to slow the town manager down. It was simply to give him more um, uh, ration, rationale to proceed. Are you calling the question? Let's call the question. Okay, the question's just, been called. Let's just do it. Um, question's been called. That does not require a second. We yes, now need to bring it to an immediate vote. I'm sorry? Yes it, yes, it does. Is there a second for calling the question? DeAngelis, second. Thank you. And the question is voted. And, and now we need to vote on whether or not we're going to call the question in the words and debate. Okay. <sighs> Sorry. This word. It requires nine votes. Okay. To end debate. Thank you. All right. Um, if you vote yes, you're saying end debate. If you vote no, you're saying you want to continue debate. I begin with Lynn Griesmer, and I am a um, yes to call the question. Mandy Jo? Yes. Anika Lopes? Yes. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Baumilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothman. Aye. Okay, we move immediately to the motion to amend. The motion to amend. 
Would you please put the motion to amend up on the screen? Okay, so this time, if you vote yes, you are voting for this motion to amend. If you vote no, you are not supporting this motion to amend. Okay. Uh, we begin with Mandy Cho. No. Anika Lopes. No. Michelle Miller. No. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. No. Kathy Shane. I, I meant yes. Sorry. I'm sorry, Pam Rooney, you said what? I meant yes, I do support my amendment. I was, wasn't going to question you. <laughs> Kathy Shane. Abstain. Andy Steinberg. No. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilm. No. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Lynn Griesmer is a no. I have eight, eight against four in favor and one abstention. Now we go back to the original motion. So please take this motion down. And the original motion is to authorize the town manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the town of Amherst and the Jones Library Incorporated acting by and for its board of trustees with an addendum slash amendment that includes a bridging agreement for the time period prior to moving to construction. Their motion's been made and seconded. Are there any other comments at this time? Then let's move to the vote. I'm gonna start with Anika Lopes. Yes. Michelle Miller. Yes, I. Dorothy Pam. No. Pam Rooney. No. Kathy Shane. No. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. No. Alicia Walker. No. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. It is uh, eight in favor and five opposed and no abstentions. So that motion carries. It only needed a, a majority. We're going to move on. No, we're going to take a break. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break and return back uh, at 8.38. Please unmute, please mute your mic and take your picture down and put them back up when you come back. Thank you. Unmute. Unmute. <laughs>
I hate to do this to you, gang, but it's time to come back. We need Athena before you can truly start. Yeah, I know, but. <laughs> Maybe I can stump you. <laughs> no, I find our back. When you return, please turn your video on. And Athena is going to take the screen down so that I can see if you're back. Um, so I'm looking for, there's Anika, Pat, Dorothy, Michelle, and Alicia, can you just let me know that you're, that back? you're back? I'm back. Yes, yes I, am I am here. Thank you, Lynn. Great. Thanks, Alicia. Michelle? Okay, um, we're going to pick up with our action items at 8C. Uh, I noticed there's a hand in the audience. We've already had public comment and there are no public other public comment tonight. So 8C is acceptance of a gift of open space on Vista Terrace. And I'm going to turn over to Assistant Town Manager Dave Zomack, who is here tonight as the acting town manager. Dave, Thank you. you get to make all the big decisions tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I trust that everyone saw my memo in the packet. Um, this is a, yeah, this is a nice little project. It's, it's been around a long time. In short, this was an effort that we worked with um, a local developer, Paul Cole, on. Hold on one second before my computer dies here. Um, uh, and the result of the project was that we are getting a gift of land, 5.39 acres, and in the process, uh, through the planning board site plan review cluster uh, development process, uh, Mr. Cole developed um, seven new houses right off of 116 in this new development called uh, Vista Terrace. The project for us really allows for a new access point to town conservation land, but also to the Mount Holyoke Range. Uh, Mr. Cole, as part of the development, actually uh, put in a small parking area there, uh, which we will activate as soon as we permit a trail up to the trails that lead up to the Mount Holyoke Range State Park. So I think I'll stop there, take any questions from the council. Questions, Mandy Jo? So one comment and one question. The deed that we were was included in that just had a misspelling. Um, it said podeway instead of roadway right after sort of oh, halfway great. down. Um, I see that. Thank you very much. But um, my question was the deed right now as presented has an easement over the road only for those conservation access purposes, um, which means it foresees the road staying a private way. And so my question is, is there an intention by the developer at some point to ask that that road become a public way? And if so, when might that happen? My understanding is that there isn't an intention from the developer to have it become a public way. And hence, we developed the easement agreement simply for the public to pass and repass up to that point of the new parking area. Okay, so I have a question. What are we giving up in taxes? Uh, we are not giving up anything in taxes because that land could not be developed as part of the cluster that was required of the cluster development. What often happens in these clusters is the land remains as subdivision open space mm -hmm. and is part of an HOA. In this case, we saw a strategic uh, opportunity to add parking for the Mount Holyoke Range and for town conservation land, which um, is in uh, high demand. Uh, as many of you know, when you go up on the um, uh, Mount Holyoke Range to the state park, parking up on 116 before you go over the notch, it's often very crowded. We did uh, build a new parking area off of Bay Road for the Sweet Alice uh, conservation area, which is also extensively used. This will be a much smaller parking lot. It's probably only hold six, seven cars, but anything we can do to, to increase access there is a plus. Okay. 
Thank you. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Just a quick question. How close is the parking spaces uh, to the private houses? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how many feet they are from them, but um, you can see in the, the maps that I included um, that the parcel is fairly large. It's about, as I said, 5.39 acres. I've met with the residents of Vista Terrace and they're very much in favor of this happening. In fact, they don't have official access to the trails off of the Mount mm -hmm. Holyoke Range. This will provide a brand new trail once it's permitted. So I've had two meetings and then some informal meetings out there with the, with the residents and they're very much in favor of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? I'm going to place the motion on the table and look for a second to approve the Conservation Commission's acceptance of a deed from Applebrook West. LLC to property located on Vista Terrace for open space and passive recreation purposes pursuant to the provisions of general law chapter 40, um, section 8C. Second. Is there any other question or comment? Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. Uh, Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Alicia. I'll come back for Alicia. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Alana Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesperson, aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. And Anika Lopes. Aye. Alicia, can you hear me? Hmm. All right. Um, the vote at this point is 12 in favor. Um, no, zero, no abstentions and one kind of missing in action. She'll, um, be, she'll be marked absent for the vote. I'm sorry? She'll be marked absent for the vote. Okay, thank you. All right, we're moving on to the next one. Uh, this is a first reading. It's a general bylaw with regard to street numbering and I'm going to call on um, Michelle for GOL. Sure, um, thanks. I just wanted to pull up my report. So uh, yes, this is um, a bylaw that was very short and nonspecific. Um, it was also limited to houses only. So uh, we felt that we wanted to add some more specific criteria and also broaden the bylaw to include all buildings. We drafted some language and we consulted with the fire chief who supported the language and then we brought it back to GOL and voted unanimously to adopt the new language. Let me note this is a first reading. Um, so there is no motion on the floor. Is there a question? Dorothy. Dorothy. You need yeah, to. Well, yeah. While you were reading this, I began to think about uh, people who say that they can't they can't get the mail delivered because the numbers are weird. And I was thinking about our accessory dwellings. Um, do they get separate numbers? Because um, many of them might be in the back. Um, I just think it might be an interesting. I think it's important with all the package delivering that we have that maybe if we do have a house an accessory dwelling in the back that there be a sign which gives the number and points to them or whatever. Just, just Michelle? Think about it. Michelle, are you aware of the- uh, Yeah, we, we did speak about this. I have an accessory dwelling and it is numbered um, and it's numbered A, so my house is A, the accessory dwelling is B. Um, but that is interesting to think about in terms of, I also have a long driveway, for example, and I have a sign down by a tree 
for 374A, but not B. So it takes the delivery people a little time um, to figure that out. Uh, but I think when we uh, were, were drafting the language and thinking about this, we were considering that all buildings, whether it's an accessory dwelling, a, a single family home, an apartment building, a commercial building, all of them are going to need to meet these requirements. Other members of GOL agree with that or want to add to that? Okay. <laughs> Anika and Pat, Anika went thumbs up, Pat shook her head. Mandy Joe, you want to weigh in? Okay. Are there any other questions? All right, this will come back on uh, October 3rd for the second reading on the motion and vote. Uh, we're then going on to the proposed amendments to council committee charges. And Michelle, I'm gonna look at the, for you again. <clears throat> sure. Um, so in the beginning of our term as a GOL, we agreed that we wanted to, to create an equity lens review process um, to make as a recommendation to the town council. And we consulted with the DI director and assistant director. Um, and upon that consultation uh, realized that they were also working on something similar and um, they were also developing a strategic plan. So we wanted to sort of work out a work plan with them, but that also honored and gave time for them to work through their process. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to make a change to the GOL charge that would somehow bring awareness to equity as we were reviewing the um, various measures that come through the committee. Um, and so we put our heads together and Councillor Henneke suggested that we consider adding some language to the end of the purpose statement for each of the town committees, the council committees, not all of the town committees. Um, and then we pulled from our vision statements and also from our structural racism resolution to um, draft that language. And then we unanimously adopted the language um, to be included uh, for each, as I said, of the council committees at the end of the purpose. With that, I'm going to make the motion. It's to amend the purpose statement of the community resources, finance, governance organization, legislation, and legislation, and town services and outreach committees charges by adding to the end of them the phrase, in quotes, giving attention to meeting the council's statements of values, particularly those of diversity, equity, and inclusion, environmental sustainability, and fiscal responsibility, as well as ensuring that measures foster an unbiased and inclusive environment that is free of discrimination, harassment, and negative stereotyping toward any person or group. Is there a second to the motion? Second. second. <laughs> okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Shalini. Yes, thank you for bringing this forward. I really appreciate this. Uh, it's something that we were already doing in CRC, we're bringing these three lenses, but I like that it's being formalized. Uh, and one question I had was, um, I think these, these three lenses we've definitely been bringing, but sometimes I'm just thinking of the other values and, and even if we speak to this, um, how are we operationalizing them or how are we making sure in some sense these three lenses are more concrete to me and we are already incorporating but i sometimes struggle with the other values that we've stated are important to us but then we are sometimes showing up in ways that may be contradicting so i'm just wondering how can we in our council in our committee meetings and maybe even council meetings bring them up like actually use them especially when we're at crossroads or how do we actually uh use them as an inner compass for the council and yeah it doesn't have to be answered if it's not ready readily available but i just wanted to put that that's the question i've been contemplating thank you are there any other comments Seeing none, we're going to move to a vote. 
I believe we are for Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmilne? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Grishmerson? Aye. Mandy Johannick? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. And Michelle Miller? Aye. It's unanimous. Uh, we dealt with appointments uh, through the um, consent agenda. Uh, and I just, I'm going to call on people for committee and liaison reports, um, but want to note that we just did these last week as well. So, Mandy Jo? We didn't have a meeting, so nothing new to report. Okay. Uh, Kathy, elementary school building? Um, I'm. At the, our next meeting, I plan on doing a longer written report, but we are starting to really look at designs of the building form. Um, and we had an in-person meeting of a subcommittee where the designers came out and they did actually, we could 3D and circulate them. So uh, what I have to find out is whether we can post that because they are doing it. And we have some extremely exciting choices. So the only other thing is, I don't know whether I mentioned that um, the Eversource has put up much higher incentives for bringing in ground source heat pumps. And the result of that is it will lower the cost of the building by about $1.2 million. Um, and these are actually at the construction site. And there are, incentives in the new federal act what we're not quite sure of is when those will be available and what the regs will be but if we um if they look like what they are is we could get as much of a third of as a third of the cost of the solar panels with direct reimbursement to the town so this is stuff for the future but right now we are moving forward hopefully to be on the agenda that lynn has shown that the town would the council will be start discussing what we're coming up with in December. Okay. Um, Finance Committee, Andy. We are kind of in a planning phase right now, so we don't have another meeting immediately scheduled. I have been working with our finance director to uh, study that long list of things that has been referred to us and as part of our normal course of business and sort it out and then we want to get it to the committee and schedule a committee meeting sort of do some group thinking on how to proceed we're also waiting for a couple of other committees to um, give us direction because uh, there were a couple of referrals that were contingent uh, that were to follow action in other committees. Okay, thank you. GOL, Michelle? I think we've reported basically on everything. Okay. John's Library, Anika, anything else to be said tonight? Well, I think that we, you know, we're up to date uh, with all things John's as well, um, but I would uh, I would encourage folks to, um, you know, as, as someone who serves on the Jones Library Building Committee, which is a group of people who have different opinions about multiple things to really, you know, check in with those meetings. If not, um, there is a thorough comprehensive um, newsletter that comes out weekly that could keep people uh, up to date. And I also just wanted to share just briefly that I know that this, you know, this vote was difficult for many and many of us are not certain, but um, you know, an observation that I had made, I, I came uh, back to the area shortly uh, before coming to town council and coming onto town council rather, and being involved with community. And I was introduced to a lot of people based on, were they for or against the library? Did they speak to each other or not? And wild assumptions made about people based on their stances, as if there is no substance beyond that. And so I hope that we as a council continue to really, you know, work together to support, understand each other, and as well have that influence on to um, the community. Um, I, should I go into TSO then? Uh, one moment. 
thought that was um, next. <laughs> I'm going to go to TSO, but first of all, I again I want to thank Dorothy for her services chair of TSO for the last uh, eight months. And uh, she remains on TSO as she was very quick to remind people at her District 3 meeting the other day, uh, which I was able to attend for part of it with Jennifer and Dorothy and Andy was there. Um, but I also want to congratulate Anika, who is now chair of TSO, and thank Shalini for her service as vice chair. And she has chosen not to continue as vice chair, but remains on the committee be very clear. And Anna is now the vice chair of that committee. So with that, Anika, report about uh, TSL. Okay, well, uh, uh, the bulk of the meeting did revolve around setting up a schedule and hearings. Uh, we did finally uh, update our schedule and scheduled hearings for the uh, parking for both um, Hope Church and Lincoln Avenue. And those are scheduled for October 13th. Uh, we also, the remainder, we had quite a thorough presentation on water regulations, which were voted unanimously um, to be referred to the council and GOL that both Anna and superintendent, um, DPW superintendent um, Amy gave quite a thorough presentation. Um, that was really uh, the bulk of it. And uh, we're you know excited to move forward. Great, thank you. Any liaison reports? I'm sorry, Dorothy, you have uh, your hand up. Um, yes, it, it's uh, I, at the same district three meeting, I think we discovered that there may have been a misunderstanding about the wording uh, for the hearing. I wanna know if that has been resolved um, because we, the TSO had voted to adopt the wording of the TAC proposal, which included Sunset and Elm. Right. So have we had time to include and, those streets I, in the call? Yes, I've communicated with um, Athena and she is in the process of making sure we know what uh, TS, um, the committee that advised you to include Elm and um, Sunset. Yeah. Yeah. And so Athena, do you see any reason why we can't post the hearing for all three streets? TSO voted to hold the hearing on all the streets in the TAC recommendation. So that's what I, I'm planning on noticing. Okay, October. so it's been resolved. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, Anna. It's just a quick one. I wanted to commend the members of ECAC for being out and visible at the um, downtown block party. They did a great job doing some engagement work around um, what folks would like to see in terms of climate action work in our community. And so it was really exciting to first off meet some of them in person for the first time, but also to uh, get to see them doing their thing. So great. kudos to them. Uh, any other liaison reports? It's hardly a time to have meetings. All right, uh, we approved the minutes. Uh, there is no new town manager's report. David, is there anything you'd like to say as the acting town manager? I thought if you if you don't mind, Lynn, I might do a couple of quick updates on projects that are in my purview. Please do so. Sure, and I'm sure Paul, when he gets back from ICMA, will have many more updates. But just moving around town very quickly, um, I'm sure council members and the public have visited the dog park. Uh, it seems to be going extremely well. Uh, every time I go by there, it is active. We have a very enthusiastic friends group uh, beginning there. They are taking uh, taking the lead with um, working with Alan Snow and the DPW to really take over uh, a lot of the maintenance of the park as well. They'll be mowing lawns. They'll be uh, um, weed whacking, uh, mulching, et cetera. And they'll also be raising more funds for the park. So that's exciting. I so I hope some of the council members and, and public will join us tomorrow at 4 p.m. at the Fort River Farm Conservation Area. We have a ribbon cutting for the new community gardens there. Um, we also are going to be celebrating the completion of the Faring Brook Restoration Project, which is on the same site. And I know Lynn will be there and, and I hope that some of the council members will be there. We'll have a short informal uh, a program and then tours of the restoration project as well as the community gardens. Um, members of the garden committee, the garden circle committee will be there um, as well as Healthy Hampshire, representatives from DEP, 
EPA and the state will be there as well. So that should be fun and, and should all be wrapped up in an hour. We're going to try to do it whether whether regardless of weather. I hope if even if it's sprinkling, we'll probably do it. Um, let's see. On on October fifteenth at ten a.m., um, we are going to be rededicating the Emily Dickinson Trail. We've been working with a a group, the Fort River Watershed Committee uh, or um, association, that got a grant for uh, work on the on the Emily Dickinson. This is the trail that begins at Groff Park and ends at the Rail Trail near uh, Southeast Street. And so um, on October 15th at 10 a.m., again, we'll have a short program and then tours of that um, new kiosks and QR codes along the trail. And then I'm working with uh, our new sustainability director, as Paul announced to you, I think uh, a week or so ago, Stephanie Ciccarello, uh, on um, the ribbon cutting for the solar project at the landfill. We are very close to ready to go. We're working with Eversource and our vendor on, on uh, the final details on that project. So we're hoping to get that ribbon cutting in before the snow flies. And then finally, Hickory Ridge, uh, we put in uh, some additional grant proposals for Hickory Ridge. Uh, we are uh, planning to bring the comprehensive plan that I promised to the council in January, uh, which will include uh, uh, opportunities, possibilities for reuse of, of the area that includes the clubhouse and the main parking area on Pomeroy Lane. It'll include restoration areas, um, trail programs, things of that sort. The solar on Hickory has been somewhat delayed. I'm not sure if you followed that uh, through the ZBA and Conservation Commission project, but due to global changes in market availability of solar, um, panels and, and the elements that make up solar panels, there is some delay on that front. So we're not sure if they're going to get started. Their hope is to do some of the pre-construction and construction this fall and actually uh, install the solar in the spring of 23. But regardless, our, our project continues. And then I think in the coming days, we do have a number of uh, grants out, out there, applications in the works. Um, I know we've gotten some positive word on, on at least one of those, but I can't quite share all the details yet, but we'll have some exciting news in the days to come on, on some grants, I'm sure. So uh, either Paul or I will uh, announce those to you uh, when he returns on later this week. So lots of things happening, trying to get things wrapped up in town uh, before the snow flies. Um, Any questions? Thanks, David. Do you have a competition going with other departments to see who gets the most grants? I probably shouldn't answer that. Yeah, yeah, right. We do have a, I would say we've always had a healthy competition with Northampton. Um, we hmm. like, you know, there's a little give and take there. They're very successful. We like to think we are successful as well. So great. it's all good for Hampshire County. Dorothy, you have your hand up. I just want to say, in terms of burnishing Amherst's image, the dog park is a success. I do not have a dog, but I went to HCC, and the um, administrative person that basically runs most of the humanities departments said, Amherst, Amherst, oh my goodness, you have such a wonderful dog park. And um, you know, so far and wide, people know, and they love it. And I, I'm very excited to hear about the Friends Group taking on responsibility for um, maintaining it to a level that they would really like. So thank you. Thanks, You're Anna. Yeah. I just don't have unfettered access to a microphone like I normally do when I'm in the room. So uh, I was just going to say, if we could give gold star stickers or something out for departments who get the most grants, I, I'm happy to incentivize this little uh, competition. That's right. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, we, uh, on terms of town council comments, under president's report, I sent you an email earlier today to tell you that, oh, I'm sorry, Pat, your hand is up. I can wait for... No, no, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a thank you, a public thank you that I want to make. Um, I wish I had made it last Monday, but I was still recovering in many ways from what was happening. 
um, two Saturdays ago, a young friend of mine, um, a fairly vulnerable person, showed up at my home quite late. Um, and Carol and I brought him in and um, it became clear, I'll try to do a short version of the story, it became clear that he was um, delusional. And um, it was clear that we needed help. Um, and talking with him, he, uh, he uh, agreed to let me call uh, dispatch to see if I could get uh, Crest responders to come to the house. Uh, so with his permission, I called Crest, I called dispatch and it was late enough that Crest was not on duty yet. Uh, because they don't have night shifts yet. Uh, the dispatcher was very uh, thoughtful and he asked me to recontact him at some point so he would know that things were okay. I then went back to my friend and started talking to him about bringing him to the hospital or, find if, or uh, finding a place to stay. I did not want him to stay in my home. Uh, and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door and I went to the door and it was the police. Um, I went back in and I told my friend that the police were there, but that I was gonna talk with them on the, on the porch. Uh, two officers came um, and they were very thoughtful, very kind. Uh, dispatch had said something about possibly sending an ambulance and the officers said that the ambulance couldn't come out without them checking the situation. Um, and how could they help? Did, did I want them to help? I went back in and talked to my friend and he said that the officers could come in, but he was also curled up on the kitchen floor crying uh, because he's afraid of the police. But he said yes. So I opened the door, one of the officers came in and she did a beautiful job of coming in where he could see her, but where she was not in the same room with him. She was very thoughtful in how she engaged with him. Um, and I'll roll the story along. Um, my friend would not go with the police to the hospital. And I asked the police to leave, which they did quite quietly um, and, um, and respectfully. And then I went back in and we were able, Carol and I, to eventually get our friend to uh, a hotel uh, and for a few nights. And the thank you goes to the two officers who came into my home and dealt so carefully with this young man. And apparently they knew him because of other situations that he was in with them and in town. And, and so they, they wanted to check that Carol and I were all right, but they really wanted to check whether he was all right. On, that Monday, I had a meeting with the town manager and Earl Miller came in just to say hi. And we started talking about this. And he said, oh, I know this person. He can become violent. He's on our radar. And what really is critical and important is nobody told me that my friend could be violent. No, the police did not try to scare me. They didn't um, get aggressive with him in any way. They remained soft, open, and relational. Earl's knowledge um, was helpful, but it came from his collaboration and relationship with the police department and with this young man. And so while I didn't have Cress available, I had it available in terms of what the police and Cress had already done, the work they had already done. Some of the anger that we see at our police is not always justified. 
And it seems to me that we can, as a community, drive away this relationship between press and police if we're not careful. If we create situations that over and over again threaten the people who, who, who make people afraid that we're, I'm getting too long-winded. So to, to shorten this, I am very grateful to our police department for coming in and caring for my friend and caring for Carol and I. So I just needed to make that public. Thank you. Pat, thank you for sharing that story because I think um, too often we forget and don't realize the extent to which our police have been extremely well trained on any number of de-escalation tactics on dealing with all kinds of difficult problems. And we have invested heavily in our police, our fire and EMS, and in our CRESS program. And together they complement each other in making ha us have a safe community. And although we're just beginning to see CRESS um, emerge, what we don't often stop to realize is that our police and fire and EMS have been handling these problems and these issues for us in our town. Every once in a while, for those of you that went on the um, tour of the fire of the police station and saw the evidence room, I still have nightmares about that evidence room because it makes me realize the depth of the issues that we have in Amherst and the extent to which we can rely on our police every day to help us address those many, many issues. David, you had a comment? I just wanted to thank Pat for sharing that. And I hope that although you shared it with the town manager, I hope that you also share it with Chief Livingstone because I'm sure that he would appreciate hearing that, you know, positive words about his staff. So thank you. Great. We do, I do want to go back and we'll come back to councilor comments on the president's report. I did send an email to you earlier today. We're on track. We have sent out the um, staff questionnaires. We've sent out the uh, committee boards and commissions uh, email. And we have also uh, place things on Engage Amherst and sent out a press release regarding the town manager evaluation. Um, is Are there any questions about the town manager evaluation piece? Anna? Yeah, so um, thank you. As I was reading through this, I, I was just curious at some point if it's possible to uh, engage TSO from that outreach end. I know that we've been doing a lot of work on, um, specifically Shalani has been doing a lot of work on what outreach might look like and um, might have some great, there might be some really great things to tap in around the town manager evaluation, specifically on the outreach component. So I think sometimes the president's reports, they're always very helpful, very thorough. You're doing a lot. And if there are things that are down the pike that we might be able to contribute beforehand to say, hey, uh -huh. it, we can help on this, um, that might be a helpful component of the reports um, if you know things are coming down the road. Okay, well, that brings me to the second thing, but before I go there. So I did do a makeup uh, president's report. I didn't do one in August, shame on me. Uh, I did do one in September that covered two months. Are there any questions about the president's report? Okay, then let's move on to future agenda items, which is a way of saying what's coming up. Um, and let me just preface this by saying, I've already received comments from two counselors uh, with regard to one or two little additions. One wasn't so small. Um, and uh, I'm already making those changes and we'll do an amendment. Uh, but are there other changes or things you need to add? Dorothy. <clears throat> I admit I they're on my desk, but I can't find them right now. So something that um, came up to Jennifer and me, and I saw Alicia commenting on it in an a, a email she sent to the town. Um, it has to do with town-gown relationships with UMass. Um, 
UMass set up some community meetings with students in certain neighborhoods, but didn't get together with the neighborhoods. And, you know, I would not dare go onto UMass campus and set up any kind of event or party or something without talking to them. And it was kind of like, we've talked about how some students seem to think that, you know, I, my, my neighborhood is part of the campus and it's not. And then if they set up a party and don't even tell us until after it's been set up, the date, the time, everything, then this is not helping town gown relationships. And it's encouraging students to think that, that we don't, you know, live in these neighborhoods. Um, and there are a lot of things that we have to say that we, we would like to, you know, input on how we can live together better. And one that we've mentioned many times before would, could there be signs at the edge of but where campus ends and to Amherst neighborhood begins, which I understand the students really can't tell where it is, that say, um, welcome to our, you know, residential neighborhood or something of that nature. So they would know, but, um, you know, it's and uh, Alicia took uh, offense at that, and I I certainly understand her feelings because it was like, how can we do some work together when we aren't even informed when they're putting the plans together? So that's it. The the dates for those meetings did appear in the town manager's report last week, but I don't think we emphasized them enough. But I agree. I have we have one coming up in District Two. Yeah. Toward the end of next week, so and it's partic around particularly the Grantwood neighborhood. Uh, Mandy Joe, we're on yeah. the future agenda yep. items. I I sent this to you, but I wanted to put it out in the meeting too, in case anyone looks at that document. The community forum for the rental residential rental program is not going to be on the twenty seventh. It is on the twenty fourth, the Monday that we do right. not have a council meeting. Um, I haven't set a start time, probably 7 p.m. like the last one, but it will not be Thursday. It will be Monday the 24th. Yeah. Thank you. And you also mentioned that we once again have to look at Article 14 and do a referral of Article 14. And Michelle, you sent me uh, two items and I've added those in handwriting to my list. Andy? Yeah, no, I uh, appreciate that Mandy um, brought up the question of the public forum on the rental um, registration bylaw revisions. I guess uh, I was not quite understanding the vision of having that before there's at least a presentation to the council about what has been the tremendous amount of work that the committee has been doing because it was a topic that I think a lot of us were interested in, but we realized that uh, you can't have a majority of the council working on an issue, even though we all care about it. And so I'd um, like to know a little bit more of the vision how that is all in vision. I'm gonna call on Mandy Joe, but also please note that on October 3rd, I've added under discussions, uh, rental fee schedule structure. This is where Mandy Joe had suggested that CRC, TSO, and finance all meet together. And if people are in agreement, I'll leave it as a item for the council to discuss on October 3rd. If not, then we have to search for a date. And then on October 17th, we do have a public dialogue. That is, that is us. That's not us. That's the council having a dialogue in front of the public about the rental bylaw. Okay, Mandy Joe. Yeah, I think um, Lynn fairly well answered that. So yeah, on the third, um, there's going to be a discussion at the council meeting on three discrete topics um, that CRC has needed help with and, and was told to seek input on, on at least one of them, the fee structure, um, before proposing a fee structure from TSO and finance. Um, but there have been some other questions that we've wanted specific um, input from other committees on. And because those committees in between CRC and those committees include at least a majority of the council. It's better to just do it at council. It's just easier um, because you can't have two committees meeting together without calling a committee of the whole. And um, then on the 17th is a council dialogue, a council discussion specifically on the rest of the 
proposed bylaw. Um, that bylaw will be out there. there. There's drafts throughout CRC meetings, but um, the one that will be discussed will probably be released after the 29th when CRC has its next meeting. Um, and that will be for the council to discuss all of the other aspects of the bylaw and give input in that. And then the week after is when the public can discuss that draft of the bylaw um, and give input in that. And then it will go back to CRC for sort of final discussions on those sections, as well as um, discussions on proposed regulations that go along with the bylaw and all of that. Um, I hope to have a set of regulations drafted, even if it has not been discussed at CRC so that people can see the potential direction of potential regulations as it would potentially look. Um, there will be a memo that accompanies both of those items for the council. So it won't just be me spouting off about what we need help with. I'm going to actually write memos for October 3rd and 17th to help guide those discussions. Andy, does that answer part of your question? Yes, it does. I uh, want to thank uh, both of you. Uh, just putting again, October 27th, CRC public meeting on rental bylaws. It's kind of an incomplete explanation, so I appreciate the more complete explanation. And it's October 24th. <laughs> I realize that it's okay. changed, but I'm looking at what was in the packet. Yeah. A little typo there. Uh, are there any other comments or questions about future agenda items? Are there any other counselor comments? Michelle. Just a reminder that Kathy and I are having a district one meeting on Sunday um, from 3 to 4.30, and it will be at the Pioneer Valley Co-Housing, which is at 120 Pulpit Hill Road. We hope everybody will join us, and we want to invite uh, our counselors at large. If you are able to join us, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. I did, just adding to what Michelle said, this will be in person and because it's in person and not in the town room, we don't have any ability for a dual Zoom meeting. So this one um, is the first I think we've had that's an in-person district one meeting um, and because people want to get together. Yeah. District three had an in-person uh, meeting as well recently, in person only and no Zoom. So. Any other comments or questions from counselors? Again, Pat, thank you for sharing your very, very heartfelt story and for your assistance as well and yours and Carol's um, in that whole situation. Uh, there are no other items and we are finished. So the meeting is adjourned and it's 925. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>